very good afternoon to all of you and welcome to the Sunset Safari. My name is Jamie and this afternoon Manu is on camera with me. And I just want to stop and have a look at this Impala. Apologies, I'll explain everything about this whole live safari deal in a second. Just want to have a look at this Impala. There's something, something odd about its behavior. It's looking very restless and very unhappy. And I just want to try and work out exactly why because this is the favorite lugger of the Angama Lions. Right, but you are on a live safari here from the Masai Mara in Kenya. At some point in the not too distant future, we will be going back across to South Africa as well. And we'll be taking you on a journey between the two countries. And as I said, we're here in the Masai Mara. This afternoon, Manu is on camera with me and we've actually got a very special guest because today, We've got, sorry Manu, that was, my, not my, that was not Manu's fault, that was my fault. Today we've got a very special guest in the form of Faith, who is the newest member of our final control team. Oh, if you would like to ask any questions, you can send them through on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. We'd love to hear from you. Questions, comments, jokes, puns, I, I, I'm open to puns. Today, of course, we are celebrating the rhinoceros. So my plan for the afternoon is to go off in find of a rhinoceros, in find of a rhinoceros, in search of a rhinoceros, to try and see exactly where they might be. There's one that hangs around Olololo Gate, and I'm excited to go and find it. Is of course, that is the wonderful thing about being here out in the Masai Mara. Speaking of big and grey things, I'm not in fact referring to Steph at all, but I am talking about the animal that he is on foot with. Good afternoon, everybody. Yeah, that is an elephant that you're having a look at. Right here from the Sabi Stand Game Reserve and out in South Africa. Isn't that just a fantastic thing to have a look at first thing in the afternoon? There's some elephants sitting in the shade enjoying the cool of it. Now there's two moms there with two babies and they're in the deep shade of a scotia tree. And the scotias are evergreen. And these ellies are just enjoying the cool breeze that's blowing at the moment and flapping their ears to create some draft and basically to cool their blood down. Wow, that sun is a bright sun ball today. Today's really, a, it feels like a, a, a summer, a summer day. It's nice and hot. The wind has been gusting out of the south, nice and warm. And that is a typical summer breeze, hopefully heralding the bringing of some rain. But excuse me, I've been quite rude. My name is Stefan Vinsboer and Senzo is on camera with me this afternoon. And uh, we are coming to you from the Kruger National Park out in South Africa. And of course, we are saying hello to the, well, to our, um, to our school today, the F.W. Cox School, as far as I know, in Virginia Beach. Welcome to all of you out there. And don't forget that this is a interactive game drive. You're welcome to send me through some questions, and please do. No question is too silly to ask, so go right ahead. So this we call a breeding herd of elephants, and the reason we call it a breeding herd is because there's presence of babies. It is headed up by a single female elephant, not a male elephant, and it will be the oldest, strongest, and wisest elephant that heads up this particular herd. And all of the other elephants here will be probably her babies and maybe her sister. Lovely, hey? Now, to another member of the Big Five, we're going to be sending you north three and a half thousand miles to my friend James, who's sitting next to some lions. Good afternoon again, everybody. I don't know if you saw this at all, but we tried to start the show with these cubs, and then we had a small technical glitch, so you may or may not have seen them so far. Here we are in the Masai Mara with some cubs. We're a long way east of where Jamie's sitting right now, about two and a half thousand miles north of where Steph is. My name is James Henry, and Fergus is on camera today. We have Daniel in the back as our ranger and what we're doing today of course is going to be sitting with these lions and the lion cubs and hoping that they get up and start to play which I think they probably will do fairly soon 
and then they might suckle. I don't think the lionesses are going to go hunting. They ate a zebra two nights ago, and I think they're probably still full of that. But let's see what happens over the course of the afternoon. Please ask us as many questions as you'd like, especially the kids at uh, Frank H. Is it Frank H. Cox a High School? It'd be lovely to hear from you. Of course, you're not really kids anymore. You're young adults uh, on your way to adulthood, an unfortunate responsibility, but you'll learn about more, more about that a bit later. So any questions you have about these cats, feel free to ask, and we'd love to hear from you. And for the rest of you, of course, you can use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or the YouTube chat stream. This is the Black Rock Pride, three lionesses, two males that look after them around the place. We saw one of them this morning. He's lying in the deep shade somewhere away from here. Barrett, do you want to know the normal size of a pride? Well, I'd say in this area, somewhere between three and five females is the normal size of the pride, and their attendant offspring. Remember, males are not part of the pride. Down where Steph is in the Kruger, yeah, three or four lionesses about the average size of a pride and their attendant offspring. When they get too much bigger than that, they tend to split up and go their separate ways, and eventually they form two sort of new prides um, that will come together and meet each other every so often, but then as the generations go by, they will become mortal enemies, as most prides who neighbor each other are. They have very exclusive territories. They won't mix with prides that are not within their own territories. And we really are very lucky to have these nine little cubs uh, to view because they are tremendously small, only about five weeks to eight weeks old. It's so very special to spend this amount of time with them. Ava, you're wondering how long the cubs stay with their mothers. Well, the females will stay with their mothers until their mothers pop off this mortal coil, in other words, until they die. So the females stay within the pride into which they're born. So let's pretend that there are five females within this pride. If all of the cubs survive, well, then it's going to be a pride of nine fairly soon. The males will be tossed out of the pride by other males, normally around about the age of three or so. So the females will stay within the pride with their mothers and aunts, and the males will be tossed out when they're about three. Very sleepy little fellows. Ellie, you're wondering how often they hunt for food? Ellie, it really does depend on what they've killed and when they've killed it. So these chaps killed a zebra two nights ago. I think what you'll find is that they'll go hunting again uh, if, I'm going to say, if not tomorrow night, the night after that. But that said, if something comes past here, let's say a buffalo or a zebra wanders through here, doesn't realize there are lions underneath this bush, well, then they'll kill it and they will eat it too. So they are very opportunistic about killing and eating. And so if they can, you know, they'll eat all the time or have something to eat all the time, something sitting by that they can eat. But they don't have to eat. They wouldn't have to eat again for about another week. Brian, you want to know how many bones are in a lion? I'm afraid I can't tell you, Brian. I have no idea how many bones there are in a lion. Um, I suppose we could work it out, but I'm not going to try and guess. Um, <laughs> I've even forgotten how many there are in a human body. I think it's somewhere around 144, isn't it? Um, I might be wrong there. But it'll be quite similar. Interestingly, most mammals have a similar number of bones in the body. Some have fused to form different kinds of bones. But uh, each kind of bone that's in a lion, you'll find it's kind of equivalent in a human being. But I've naturally forgotten how many bones exactly there are in a lion Oh, I don't think I ever knew that, but how many there are in a human being, I never really knew that. Ah, 206 bones in a human being, I've been told by the final control. 206 bones, and so in a line I'm going to say plus minus 206. Can you believe the number? Apparently there are even more in a lion, 260. Amazing what the internet can tell you these days. 260 bones in a lion, 206 in a human being. Now, I probably won't forget that because they've got the same digits in them. Okay, 206 and 260, that's great information. So you'll find that a lion's probably got extra vertebra, uh, extra vertebra in the tail and, of course, in the back. And then while I work out where the rest of the bones might fit, we're going to send you back 
to South Africa and Steph. I think he's got something very large and I suspect in the heat there it'll hopefully be heading towards some water. Elephants are some of the most dangerous animals out here in the bush and it's a very good idea not to get in front of them and to watch elephants body language all the time. So you want to you want to watch the bigger elephants. You don't worry too much about the smaller ones, but the bigger ones like this female just here. You want to see if she lifts up her head and stops flapping her ears. A lot of people think that when an elephant flaps her ears or and, and it means that they cross, but it actually is just to cool them down. All their blood in their body goes through their ears in a very short space of time, and it can cool their blood down to a point which lets them walk around in the hot African sun like they're doing now. Otherwise, big animals like this would be confined to the shade until it got a bit cooler. But she's now moving off. She's very relaxed with this youngster. Let's go forward a little bit more and see if we can get a little bit closer and have another look what they're doing. Now elephants feed with their trunk, they pick up bits and pieces of plant material with their trunk and then put it into their mouth. And a trunk is a funny appendage. A trunk is basically the extension of the nose and the top lip. And it is the most amazing organ on an elephant. Without the use of their trunk, their ears or their feet, an elephant wouldn't survive. And look at those beautiful feet got the weirdest feet. Always looks like their back legs always look like they got baggy pajamas on. Baggy grey pajamas. The young elephant here next to us couldn't quite pull out the branch with its trunk and so it's got the whole tree in its mouth. Have a look there. It wasn't strong enough to pull out the tree. It's now just biting off pieces of branch at mouth level. This time of the year, about 80% of their diet is made up of woody species of plants. So, not grass, but bark, branches, leaves, roots, tubers and bulbs. And just have a look at how dexterous that trunk is. Do you want to know how is an elephant's structural DNA important to its survival? Well, I'd like to say that elephants are next to leopard, one of the most adaptable animals on the face of the planet. Certainly in Africa that's the case. And without its DNA allowing it to adapt very quickly, and I'm talking about within a couple of generations, and that is incredibly quickly uh, by any species' account. Elephants can adapt to life in the forest. They live in thick forests, in jungle in fact, all the way out to deserts. One of the very, very few animals that occurs in that range of habitats. And it's because their bodies can adapt so well. They can get longer legs in sandier areas. They can get smaller, shorter, straighter tusked tusks in areas with large bush. They can develop big bodies with big mass and big muscles when there's not a lot of grass but a lot of big trees that require strength to push them down. They can uh, develop stronger hips to stand on their back legs to reach up into taller trees. Um, smaller ears to cope with a more humid environment. There is just an endless sort of mix of elephants and they can do this all within a, a couple of generations from, from one another. And uh, like I said, that is truly remarkable. It usually takes many, many generations before you get something like that right. And in elephant's case, that isn't true. Get this one. In profile, have a look at the forehead and you'll notice that the forehead is round. That is a male elephant. Brian, you want to know if elephants challenge one another? Do they fight with each other for position, like hierarchy or for food or for feeding opportunities? Um, 
They don't. In an elephant herd, it's led by a female. The female is the oldest, wisest, strongest female. That is not something that you can contest. That is just something that happens with time. Um, so in a herd, there's no competition. You sometimes find elephant calves getting a bit boisterous over a tasty morsel, but females hardly ever fight over anything like resources. Male elephants, on the other hand, are very different. Male elephants will joust with each other for the attentions of a female in an effort to prove to that female that they fit and they're strong. And that in turn means that they are going to potentially sire very fit and strong offspring. And so females are programmed to respond to fit and strong males and they prove that strength and virility by jousting with one another. And elephants of the same size will wrestle with each other and sometimes even unto death. Uh, to get it right. So, in an elephant herd, no. With male elephants, something completely different, and then that's a yes. We're going to forward a little bit. These Ellies have moved on now, and let's see if we can get into a better position once again. They can cover up to 50 miles in a day. These elephants don't need to do that because there's, relatively speaking, a lot of water and food around, but they can move some incredible distances. This one here is a youngster getting a little bit insecure. Now we are in the herd, so to say, right where we are. Surrounded by elephant. We've got elephant in a greater than 180 degree arc around us. Aiden, you'd like to know if elephants have bones in their trunks. And secondly, you'd like to know how many bones an elephant has in its body. Um, Aiden, to the first question, no, they don't have any bones in their trunks. Their trunk is a muscle, singularly a muscle, that contains all the different types of muscle strands that you get. Uh, and secondly, it is attached to their foreheads. So let me go forward a little bit. So that you, yeah, here we go, this, this female coming out here now. So you can see that she's a female because she's got an angled forehead, not rounded like that male. And there just above her eyes is the attachment for her trunk. The trunk then lies on a casing of bone and then hangs down and it contains just muscles. Now to the second part of your question, how many bones does an elephant have in its body? That is a difficult question for me to answer as I don't really know the answer to that question. Uh, but being mammals and being related, uh, to other elephants, I would imagine that it's upwards of the 200s, probably around about 220 to about 230 bones in an elephant's body. I would imagine somewhere around about there. Ah, hang on, wait. Louise is telling me that there's 320 bones in an elephant's body. Can you believe it? So a lot more than what we've got. And um, they are enormous bones. An elephant's front leg bone, for instance, you could use as a dumbbell in a bar, in, in a gym that is heavy and solid. And it's because an elephant carries about 60% of their weight over their front legs. Isn't that fantastic? As a young elephant, just testing out the grass with its trunk. It doesn't need to uh, feed on grass just yet. It's still drinking milk from mom and will continue to do so for two years. Now, some one thing else that's drinking milk from mom are those lions that James are with. We're going to have a look at them. There we have the lions and they are drinking milk. Well, just the one little one is drinking. The rest of them are sleeping and we just have a very strong gust of wind blow through here. And it's kind of woken everyone up a little bit. Dust blowing into the face and the nose can do that sort of thing. But something's actually just walked past here and it's just going over the horizon in a rather sort of quintessentially beautiful African scene there. A huge giraffe just came walking past. The lions didn't notice him, he didn't notice the lions. We noticed them both, and now the giraffe is heading off into the distance. Isn't that nice? You can see a bit of cloud building there. I don't think it's going to rain. Daniel, our ranger, thinks it's going to rain. So maybe it will. Who knows? But he seems to be staring off into the distance, considering the difficulties of giraffe life here in the Masai Mara.
Now, Crispy Chippy, you're wondering if lions eat hyenas. Uh, it's actually something they probably don't eat. They normally eat just about anything. But they don't seem to enjoy the flesh of hyenas. I've seen them kill hyenas before. But I have never seen them eat hyenas. Hyenas eat other hyenas, interestingly, if they kill them. Sometimes, not all the time. I have seen lions eating other lions quite frequently. But I haven't seen a lion eating a hyena. I'm sure it does happen from time to time. Because a lion is not very fussy about what it eats. They eat a huge amount of diff or a huge number of different things. Many of them, what we would consider completely rancid, disgusting things, and we wouldn't think about eating them. You can see a hot day like this. I'm going to say it's probably about 86 degrees or so Fahrenheit. Clark, you want to know if I've ever been attacked or charged um, by an animal while I'm on safari? Clark, yes, I used to be six foot four and I'm now five foot eight. So you know that the trials and tribulations of being safari guide have, have knocked some six inches off my height. Sorry, it's ten inches. Now I'm being facetious. Um, eight inches, I mean. Uh, Cl Clark, I, I have been charged from time to time by various creatures. Um, normally, when I've got too close and I've made the animal feel threatened, normally, Clark, animals will move away when they feel threatened. And we as human beings, especially on foot, threaten animals. We make them feel afraid because they see us as predators. And so normally then they will walk away and move away from us. Unless we get so close uh, that the animals feel cornered. And if they feel cornered, then they will turn around and attack. So yes, I've been charged once or twice by buffalo and elephant, one or two times by lions and sometimes by leopards. It doesn't happen very often and almost always it's been because I have been insensitive to the needs of the animals that I've been looking at or trying to track or trying to find. And so it's very important you understand. Uh, you know, a lot of people will tell you that being a guide or being a ranger out here is very dangerous because they want to come across as being big and tough and manly and, uh, you know, kind of uh, braver than everyone else. But in actual fact, the, doing the job that I do is much more about a sensitivity to the creatures that you look at. That is a tremendously powerful animal you're looking at. She could kill you with one swat of her front paw, but she doesn't want to. And so to provoke her into making, into wanting to, you've really got to do something pretty stupid most of the time. Of course, sometimes we may have accidents, uh, we make mistakes, we get into animal spaces, and they don't like that. Um, but uh, by and large, if you are careful and you respect animals, especially like the ones that Jamie's going to show you now, you would be absolutely fine. Let's head across to Jamie for an animal that most people fear, but that is actually normally very kind to us. I hope most of you don't fear them too much because they really are lovely creatures. We found ourselves inextricably drawn to a herd of elephants that are feeding in front of us. We're just so desperate to come and have a look at them that we just couldn't resist, could we? Lovely, lovely elephants all gathered together. You can see they've been enjoying a mud bath, covering themselves, protecting their skin against what is a very warm day out here in the Masai Mara. Coated in mud to help to protect their skin and of course to help with all those itchy patches that they can't quite reach. So I just had to stop. Even though I'm searching for a rhinoceros, I just had to stop to have a look at the elephants as well. A female and her calf, quite an old calf, probably over three years old. I'd say somewhere around the region of three and a half. Lovely question coming through from Hallie. Now, Hallie, you want to know how long it takes elephants to reach their fully grown size. Hallie, the truth is they never completely stop growing. But for the females at around about 20 or so, their growth really slows down. So if you picture an elephant's growth as a graph, um, and, and it's sort of dictated by how old they are. They grow very, very fast in their first few years, and then it slows down and the curve sort of evens out until the growth is barely noticeable 
possible. But once they reach sexual maturity, that's when their growth really starts to slow down. So they grow rapidly for their first few years and then slowly after that. And of course, their tusks continue to grow throughout their lives. And what's amazing here is just how much longer the tusks are on the females in Kenya than they are in South Africa. And I'm convinced it at least partially has something to do with the softness of the food that they eat here. They eat grass. And of course, the elephants in South Africa eat grass as well. But because the grass is green here and there's more of it for a longer period of time, I think that the elephants here eat less in the way of bark and branches. Jacob, elephants are strictly herbivores. Uh, in terms of eating meat, um, so something that we've chatted about is the process of osteophagy, which isn't really eating meat, but elephants will occasionally chew on bones as a way of supplementing their calcium. What you will find is they are curious animals. They might walk up to a carcass and have a look. You know, if something's killed a wildebeest or there's something that's died of natural causes, they will go up and have a look. But no, they are strictly herbivorous. They will often go to salt licks to eat the dirt to supplement the minerals and they will chew bones, but their diet is plant-based. There are quite a few herbivore animals out here that do eat meat though. Not enough for them to be considered to be herbivore, uh, to be considered to be omnivores, but enough that it's something interesting about them. So something like a warthog, which I saw earlier, but I think they've scuttled off. A warthog is a, belongs to the pig family. A warthog will eat meat, much like lots of pigs, lots of members of the pig family. Uh, there's certain antelope that will eat meat as well. Oh, look at this. Have a look. Sorry, Manu. Have a look at the, the baby at the back. I've just remembered to point this out. Look at that. Somebody had, a, I would say, probably a close encounter with a, a hyena or a lion at a very, very young age. Might not be that, though. It might not have lost its tail because of a predator. See, there's mum's tail. That's what its tail should look like. It might have been a scratch or something that got infected, and then obviously the infection could have spread and then caused the tail to drop off. But my money would be on a hyena. Something harassing it while it was very, very small. Which is a dangerous thing for a predator to do out here because the entire elephant herd will band around the baby and protect it. But something happened to cause that loss of the tail. David, elephants are an endangered species throughout Africa, and their numbers are declining at an alarming rate. The one amazing thing about being here in the Masai Mara, and also I have to say in South Africa as well, is that the, these are countries that are doing their utmost to protect the various animal species against problems like poaching. Now, one of the big things that we've done to all animals out here, whether it is the lions, the elephants, or anything like an antelope, is that we've restricted their numbers because we've restricted their habitats. So obviously it makes sense that in the past 500 years, the wild places have got smaller and smaller and smaller. But the biggest problem where elephants are concerned has been poaching. And what you'll find is that the problem is worse in countries that are not politically stable. And what often happens is when there is money to be made from selling the ivory of the elephant or the horn of the rhinoceros, and you'll see that there's a dramatic increase in places that are at war, perhaps a civil war or perhaps some kind of unrest. And a lot of the time that money it goes to, to arms dealing in those countries. And of course, there's just a general breakdown of law and order. But here, these elephants are protected. Ava, these elephants will live for anywhere up to potentially 70 years. That's quite a long time for an elephant, though. But around about 60, the males don't live as long as the females do. But that is essentially a human being's lifetime. Now, we do live, live a little bit longer. But just think how much learning ability these fantastic creatures have, which is why we treasure each and every single moment that we spend with them. And, of course, which is why we're not going to complain about spending any more time time with them, whether it's the elephants in the Masai Mara or it's the elephants across in South Africa. All right, one last look at the elephant and then off you go. We've got an elephant right behind us. Come and have a look at this. She's just come to have a, have a sniff at our vehicle. 
That's how close she is. <laughs> a huge elephant. That's probably the matriarch right there. And testimony to how relaxed these animals are and that she allows us close with her family, including all these babies around. And, uh, and without so much as a trumpet. This little youngster, he's busy practicing stripping the bark off of a branch with his teeth. They don't only just crunch through it, quite often they just want the sugary taste from the bark and will roll the stump between their molars and strip it of some bark. And he's been toying with that, having watched his mom do it very efficiently. You can see they're using it and you'll see it come out the one side. The older elephant comes out like it's okay, okay, I'm not making fun of you. They're quite sensitive things, elephants. I think they know when you're making a bit of fun of them. Now, David, you like to know how much food an elephant eats on a typical day? For a big male elephant, which is roughly double the size of all of these ones here, he'll eat about 400 pounds of food per day. Females will eat about 300, and 300 pounds to 350 pounds, if they can. Sometimes they eat all of that in 16 hours in the middle of summer. Sometimes they eat all of that in 20, uh, 20 almost close to 24 hours. I'm going to go closer now, yeah? Let's see if we can go and change the angle just a little bit on this herd. Give us a bit of a better view. So sometimes they will spend up to 24 hours a day eating. This is the driest month of the year here. Uh, in actual fact, sorry, October is the driest month of the year, driest, hottest months, months of the year. And it's in these months that they battle to find food the most. And it's also this time of the year that they will be, eat, they will, they will be feeding the longest. For these babies, they'll sleep at night, most nights, but that's because mom is still feeding it. Now if you have a look on top of the elephant's back, you'll notice this youngster. You'll notice some small hairs. When they're born, they're covered in a red fuzz and he's still got some of his baby fuzz left on his back there, where his mom hasn't got anything. Clark, you've asked two very different questions from one another. You've asked, what is an elephant's closest living relative? And then you've asked me, do they have any symbiotic relationships with other animals? Now that's a very important question, I'm going to answer that one first. Elephants are known as keystone species. Without elephant, oh no big boy, what are you doing? Are you charging me? Okay, I'm scared. Sufficiently scared, you're a very brave boy. Um, elephants are known as keystone species. Without elephants in an environment, the environment is imbalanced and unhealthy and requires intervention. And so I would argue that the environment is in symbiosis with an elephant. And there are a few animals like that. Uh, hippos are one, fig trees and fig wasps are another. And I would say that uh, the environment is in symbiosis with an elephant. Without elephant, the environments don't exist, and obviously without the environment, the elephants don't exist. So a type of commensalism, so to say. Um, to narrow it down and to become even more detailed on what animals specifically rely on, on, on uh, elephant, I would have to say that you watch these elephants feeding now through the canopy. What they do is they open up the bush so that sunlight reaches the forest floor. They open up the bush and break down trees which allow a higher water content to come to the surface and therefore benefit grasses. And so without elephant, you're finding the bush becomes too thickety, grass doesn't really, uh, if it's not good for grasses that enjoy sunlight or at least dappled sunlight or uh, thorn trees proliferate. There's a whole bunch, there's a knock-on effect. Waterways don't stay open, mud wallows don't get caked in, in clay and hold water for longer. It's just it's systemic. Now to answer your second question about what is the closest relative, it is a tiny rabbit-like creature called a hyrax, H-Y-R-A-X. 
and they are the closest living relatives to elephants nowadays. They split off from one another a couple of million years ago and uh, elephants have been left to develop along their way and hyrax have been left to develop along their way but let me show you what a hyrax looks like so that you can understand a little bit more excuse me i've got a roaring cold at the moment 296 so i'll be there in a jiffy there we go So that is a rock hyrax and that is the closest living relative to an elephant. How bizarre is that? Now, on that note, I'm going to send you all the way north to my friend James and see you soon. We have left our lions and we're now going to show you one or two other things that are living here in the Masai Mara. I'm trying to find a road that goes down to a beautiful little river. Please excuse the wind. It is now starting to howl for some reason. It does blow quite a lot in this area. The first thing we'll have a look at are some zebras. And these particular zebras are known as grass zebras. There we are. For why this wind has suddenly come up. Anyway, there is a grass zebra staring at you, wondering why on earth you're looking at him as he goes about his daily business, but there it is. You can see the wind blowing his tail and a whole lot of them in the background. Then if we pan slowly to the right hand, to the left hand side, sorry, we've got one lonely impala, which I can't see anymore. There they are, just beyond the zebras there. And beyond them, We've got a whole lot of buffalo, and they're going down to the water to drink. There's a really nice river there, full of water, and the buffalo are going down there to drink. So there really is a tremendous expanse of land, and I'm sure you can see the difference between this space and the space that Steph is in. So Southern Africa and East Africa are very different. Michelle, you're wondering what the educational requirements are for somebody who does the job that I do. Uh, the answer is there is no fixed answer to that question. There are many guides around the place who have got, you know, from no qualifications to qualifications in IT, to having been in the army, to having biological degrees, to having sociological degrees, to, doing, to being accountants, uh, lawyers, all sorts of things. So sometimes people finish their degrees and come out to the bush and then, you know, they spend two or three years out here and then they go back and do whatever they qualified to do. Other times people who thought that they were going to be economists uh, decide to spend some time in the bush and then never leave. Uh, some people have absolutely no qualifications at all other than a you know, real love of animals and they start off and then they get a guiding license which isn't particularly difficult to do if you've got a quarter of a brain and you can do that in various parts in East Africa and down in South Africa. Uh, so it really just does, does depend on what you want to do and what your educational bent is and how your mind works and what works best for you. So there's no fixed way to do it. I'm just trying to think, I mean, of the people who work for Wild Earth. Jamie, for example, is a lawyer. She was, she's not, she, didn't, she did a law degree. Uh, Brent started off doing an economics degree, I think. Steph is a geologist by trade. Um, I did a biological degree and then a sociological degree. So, you know, it really does depend. And some people who we work with have no degrees at all. And some people just have guiding licenses and the various guiding qualifications that you need. Aidan, you want to know if zebras travel in herds? I'm hoping the picture you're looking at now answers that question for you. They do, and they travel, I suppose, in, in yeah, they travel in big in herds, but the herds are made up of smaller groupings called kinship groups, and kinship groups consist of stallions, their mares, so their wives, and then their attendant youngsters. And they're normally a sort of a stallion will have two or three or four wives, and, he'll, and they will have one baby each with them at any one time. So that's a kinship group, and then those kinship groups come together in much greater groupings that we'd call herds of zebras.
but those herds are quite temporary. They're not sort of um, fixed social arrangements, if you like. Let's carry on over the top of the hill here and see what else we can find. Aiden, that's quite an interesting question. You say, do the herds of animals here mix without conflict? You'll find that they do. Uh, they don't, I mean, it's very solemn you'd find a herd of zebra mixing with a herd of buffalo. Uh, and if they did, well, no, there probably wouldn't be much conflict, but they tend to avoid each other. Zebra and wildebeest you will often find together, and you'll find that there's much more conflict between the zebra than amongst the zebra and the wildebeest. So, yes, they do move from time to time in groups, but, you know, during the Great Migration, which is the most famous part of this ecology's kind of uh, animal behavior, if you like, uh, there are 2 million animals, something like 1.2 million uh, wildebeest, 500,000 zebras, and the rest made up of Thompson's gazelle, 200,000 of them odd, and then some eland, and they all move kind of in overlapping groups, but they're not all in a big mishmash. Then we've got some topi up ahead, but we're going to head across to Jamie and find out what she's got, and I'll tell you about the topi a little bit later. I haven't got anything yet, but I think that the people on the other side of the drainage line do, which is the story of my life. So there's a massive drainage line that runs along here, a river system that will... Hello. And it's impossible for me to cross, although it's nice to stop and have a look at this elephant who I think is having a drink. Possibly just stopping to feed off some of the green stuff that grows down here. But it is impossible for me to cross. And I, I'm really hoping that it's a rhino because I've been told that there is one somewhere here. Ah. Very, very, Aiden, I've wondered the same things many, many, many times myself. And I don't just wonder it about elephants, I wonder it about the other creatures as well. So Aiden's wondering about if we have a perception of how elephants taste. Do certain grasses taste better than others, certain types of plant? To a degree, yes, we do. We know they love sugar. We know that they love fructose, in particular fruit oranges, any kind of fruit like that, an elephant will go for. Marulas, when it is marula fruiting season in South Africa, the elephants spend a huge amount of their time eating marula fruits. So we know that that is particularly appealing to them. We know that they like certain species of grass, and it tends to be grass that has very high nutrient capacity as well as being quite soft and green. We know that they prefer for the most part, they prefer to eat grass. They will eat grasses over leaves, which again makes sense, nice and easy to digest and soft. But of course, in a place like South Africa, they can't always get grass. You've seen how dry it is around Steph. So they can't always get grass. They will go for certain trees. They like certain trees more than they like other trees, but they will eat whatever they have to eat in order to provide themselves with nutrients. Do we know exactly how they taste and how they respond to certain tastes? Not completely, no. You know, I sometimes wonder, do, do lions, when they eat a fresh buffalo versus when they eat a rotten buffalo, does it bother them? Does the taste difference bother them? We know that they'd probably go for a fresh one over an old carcass if they have a choice. But I often wonder about how animals experience taste. We're so spoiled with our vast array of different tastes. Ah, we've gone from the tasting to part to the chewing part. From Aiden once again, elephants do have teeth. Their tusks are actually modified teeth, and those are permanent, and those will grow for the rest of their lives. But what is really, truly fascinating is the structure of their teeth at the back. So what they have is they have four motors, two on the top, two on the bottom that move through a conveyor belt-like system. So essentially are replaced six times, well, they have six sets, so they're replaced five times for the duration of their life. 
And once they get to the end of that point, their last and their final set, they will actually have worn them down completely. And that's one of the reasons why old elephants look particularly thin, particularly undernourished. It's because they can't chew their food properly and therefore they can't digest it. Unfortunately, it is time for us to say goodbye to the students at Frank W. Cox High School. It's been an absolute pleasure enjoying your company. For the rest of you, you're going to be going back across to Steph for the rest of the safari. Leather, you know, like thumbing a nice car seat or a comfortable pair of shoes. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, Louise, just repeat that. Ah, excuse me, sorry, I didn't know that I was loud. <laughs> I was just busy laughing at myself about rubbing my head and how it feels like a comfortable pair of shoes or like an old car seat. And uh, <laughs> it's just nice and comforting from time to time. You know? We're going to go through a bit of a signal dip here. Don't worry, don't go anywhere. It is for the briefest moments of time. Okay. Put it on the screen. My voice might disappear. But all in all, it should be okay from about now. And uh, here we go. All done. We are making our way to Bavosek Dam, where I heard that there was a, a lion sleeping underneath a tree. So that is what we're going to be going to go and have a look for. Oh. How does that work? Apparently my audio is very muffled and you can't hear what I'm saying and I just think it's because we're driving a bit faster than, than usual. So there we go, all fixed. So um, let me just hold it like this and protect you from the wind. So we're going to be going off to Bifelzook Dam and, uh, and we're going to go and look for some lion that we've seen there this morning. I'm hoping that it'll be one of the Ngahumas and we can see what condition they're in and see if they managed to catch something last night. So that is my mission. They were in Torchwood at the end of drive. And uh, they, uh, they, will, they will be pushed back this way by the Torchwood Pride. And so we're going to see what, what, uh, what they got up to last night if they managed to find some food. In the meantime, why don't we send you back to James? He's got some lions of his own. Uh, lions, did he say? No, we've got some zebra, and not only the zebra, then we also have some wonderful elephants. There they are. And just look at the extent of the space there. A herd of elephants, uh, not elephants, a herd of zebra moving behind the elephants down towards the same, I think, water hole where those buffalo were going. really is very beautiful to watch and you can just feel the breeze it's very hot but there's nice cool uh, quite cool sort of breeze blowing over us now see Nak, you're wondering which is bigger the grevy zebra or the plain zebra as far as i remember the grevy zebra is substantially larger uh, than the plain zebra but i have a special book that will tell me if i'm lying to you or if i am attempting to tell you the truth see Nak? Uh, mountain zebra, big male, 390 kilograms or so, which is pretty heavy. Yeah, big gravy zebra weighs in the region of 450 kilograms, which in pounds is about a thousand pounds. So 380 to 450 kilograms. So that's the gravies. And then the common or plain zebra, uh, normally sort of around about a male up to 350 kilos, but that would be a very big one. So normally around 320 or so kilos for a male. If you want to work that out in pounds, you can just multiply it by 2.2 and my brain And elephant picking Forbes, obviously struggling to graze, given that all the grass is now gone, thanks to the zebra and the wildebeesten that came through this area. And surprisingly few Thompson's gazelles. 
And I just want to quickly show you the hills to the far east of where we are now are the far eastern boundary of the Masai Mara. And somewhere amongst them there, the Ololai Muchik village, which is the very far eastern gate of the Masai Mara. Tremendously peaceful scene this. And Umkar, you're wondering if we get marula trees in the Masai Mara. I'm 99% sure that we do not get marula trees in the Masai Mara, but you'll be astounded to find out that I have got, well, a, another book that will tell me whether I'm lying to you again or whether I'm telling you the truth. We just need to head along to Scalero Carrier Biria. See if they are here. No, I'm pretty sure that they don't. They're not in this book that I'm looking at, so I don't think the marula tree does occur in this particular area. I certainly haven't seen one myself. But you know, as I've said a few times, we have spent such a lot of time following predators and kind of looking at big stuff that our, um, uh, well, our tree knowledge and our knowledge of the, the general flora of the area, I think, is slightly lacking. And so we're still learning about that. No, no marula. Oh, there's marula in this book. Let me just find out where it is found. I mean, I don't see any reason why it shouldn't be found here. So here it is, Clericaria barrier. Distribution. Mm -hmm. Widely distributed dry areas found mixed deciduous woodlands, wooded grass, and open bushland. Very common on sandy loamy soils. Grows from, ah, here we go. Grows from sea level to about 1,200 meters above sea level. Now, we are slightly higher than that. Well, are we? We're about 1,000 meters above sea level here. So, uh, I, I, I'm going to say to you, they probably occur, but very infrequently in this area. It's a nice question. Thank you for that. It doesn't actually have a mark, not a mark, it doesn't have a, a map on this particular page of the book. Alas. Gorgeous, peaceful scenes and a sky that is utterly endless at the moment. We will go back to those lions as things cool down a little bit and see what the cubs do. I'm just going to have to move because there's a not insubstantial vehicle coming up behind me. Yeah, I'm glad that you... Ooh. <laughs> and the truck's name is Isabel. There's a sign on the back that says Isabel. Goodbye, Isabel. Now, the elephant is noticeably distressed by the sight of that thing. Good grief. It's like a cruise ship on wheels. See, now, you want to know how big an elephant's eardrum is? Well, roughly the same size as a timpani that you might play in the uh, Royal Philharmonic Orchestra. Uh, Sinak, I don't know. I'm going to guess, having looked at an elephant's skull, that it's probably about this big. I'd say an elephant's eardrum is probably about around about that size, about the size of my head, width of my head. All right, let's follow Isabel up down through there. <laughs> Come back, Isabel. The people on the back of that truck look like they were having the best time in the world. I'm not sure. Oh, I don't know that we're going to get out of this um, out of this ditch we found ourselves in here. <laughs> you know, I pulled halfway off the road. It didn't help. We we had to get all the way off. <laughs> exactly. Right, as uh, Fergus says, we were like two ships passing in the Panama Canal. Uh, let's head back down to South Africa. Steph has managed to find himself a cat. I bet it's lying very sleepily in the shade. We are in for a treat today, everyone. We've got the entire Inkahuma Pride, it looks like. And they are static around Buffalo Dam. 
And we've got the tiny little babies with us. Have a look there. That is properly cool. They still haven't eaten anything. Now, it's not to say that they're not eating things. I mean, they'd fairly easily be able to catch impala relatively easily. Um, but impala and impala, single impala won't go a long way to, to feed all of these hungry males. I mean, look at that male's tummy. That's a young male, I think. He's having a wee on his baby brother. Rude boy. And his tummy doesn't look that empty. Look at that, it's got a slight bulge to it. I think he has had something to eat, you know. I don't think much. Boom, down. The mom in the background, it doesn't look like they've had much to eat. Crispy Chippy, you'd like to know how many cubs an adult lioness has. Um, they can have anywhere from two to about, or from one to six cubs. The average is two to four. Um, with about a 70% mortality rate across the lion's entire African range. So in some areas, more cubs survive than others. And that's because environments are harsher in some areas than others. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. But in this particular area, I think that the average uh, mortality rate over the period of a couple of years is probably close to 70%. But on a year-to-year -year basis, uh, I think it's slightly uh, lower than that. Now, what kills cubs? Generally speaking, starvation or disease will kill cubs. Um, with adults picking their own survival over the survival of their cubs. And that's because lions can give birth relatively quickly after a catastrophe has befallen them. And obviously for the benefit of the species, this particular species, lions, will choose survival of the fittest over survival of their babies, which is unlike primates, uh, who will almost always try and save their babies above all else. Oh, they are cute. Now, I definitely think they've eaten something. The key would be to go and have a look at this male's tummy. See, Nack, you'd like to know how long lion cubs suckle for. Well, see, Nack, they'd start to eat meat at about eight weeks. Um, they will still suckle, though, up until nine months, and it's not uncommon for them to suckle up to a year and a half. That's not a male, male lion, obviously. And why I say the trick would be to see if they caught something, if his belly's full. He's hanging around with these, I oh know, of course his belly is hidden completely by that stick. He's hanging around with these females to make sure that any female coming into estrus is looked after and is covered by him. In return for that, uh, he steals all their food. So I know it doesn't sound like a very comfortable uh, and healthy uh, relationship. But with this male around and with him being dominant over these females, or actually him being dominant in this area, he's not dominant over the females, um, he provides a safety uh, net basically for these cubs. If other males were allowed to enter into this environment, they would kill the cubs hoping to bring the females into estrus and then covering them and uh, siring their own offspring and their own genes into this into this area. With him being here and him being kept fat and happy and fit and strong, the females basically pay for a bodyguard of epic proportions. Let's have a look at that with his mouth hanging open. This is a lion we call Tino, means tooth or the toothed one. And as you can see, you'd think it would be quite romantic, but the toothed one just refers to whatever the hell's going on with his lip there. It looks like he's been stung by a swarm of a thousand bees. A male lion have one of the hardest lives out there, born into a harsh environment. They live a hard life. They die hard eventually. I don't know what's going on with his... Excuse me. I don't know what's going on with his... Uh, with his lip. Definitely doesn't look comfortable. I'm 
Lucar, you'd like to know if a lioness will still suckle cubs if her own has died? Yes, they will. They they cooperatively nurse. They share nursing duties with one another. So any lactating mother will be able to suckle any cub and will do so. It's quite often the only thing that keeps cubs alive is the fact that mothers can share milk or share the milk, the collective milk uh, in the pride amongst all the babies that need it. And uh, these little <coughs> youngsters now can use every little bit of nutrition that they can muster. They're now part of the Pride's movements per night. And can you imagine in a season like this where pickings are rather slim this year, that, um, that they are needing to... Can you imagine those short little legs having to run through the grass like they have to to keep up with mom and aunties? It will be a monumental task. So James, you'd like to know if these cubs are moving um, full time with mom now? Um, no, I don't think so. Um, they were. We found tracks of lioness this morning, and very early heard lionesses roaring uh, this morning. I think it was her. I think she'd been storing these cubs in the drainage line system around Galago, um, which is close to our camp is, and about two and a half miles or so from here. And I think what happened is the pride hunted far yesterday into Torchwood. They then were pushed by the Torchwood pride back onto Voyatella, which is this portion of land where we are now. It's the name of it. And because this is the core of their territory, she came back to fetch the little ones and bring them to the safety of the pride late last night, early this morning. And uh, it's just safer for these little ones here. And a two-mile walk for these little babies is not too much of an effort now. So I think going forward, they're going to be spending more and more time with the, the adults and the rest of the pride. It's safer for them to do that. But to be honest with you, the, uh, the, if the lions are, are going to need to move far, and I would imagine that in their current hunger state, they are going to need to move far, that... Uh, that, uh, that they'd be left uh, alone again. That's it, let me just think about what I've just said. So in the dry season, lions tend to congregate around pans and dams. Them congregating around Biffleshook Dam is a good idea. And you might find that they don't move from here and just start catching things that are coming down to drink. It's a very good lion tactic. In the dry season like this, animals need to drink and they come down to the pans to do so. And uh, the hope is that they can ambush prey coming to do that. But there's so much water this year around here that I think the prey animals are very dispersed uh, in this particular area. And it's making picking slim for such a large pride. See, Control, you'd like to know if males from the same coalition would ever kill each other's cubs. Uh, no, uh, they wouldn't. And the reason for that is that the males in the same pride, the, the coalition males, are related to each other and therefore their genes are part of the successful genes in that particular area. And even though they're not siring the cubs, themselves they would like their pride's genes in uh, in in this particular pride and it it makes for a much deeper genetic pool so to say by not um, making it too specific uh, in other words keep the pride's genes strong rather than an individual's genes strong and uh, in my opinion at least anyway you create a bit more of a robust nature. Excuse me going into a very nasally sound every now and again. It feels like I've got foot and mouth disease with the amount of fluid falling out of my face at the moment. I do not suggest we zoom out. <laughs> Thank you. Steve, I know he's not feeling well and I know exactly how that feels. 
We've got exciting news, really exciting news. And you know that we've been trying to find that cheetah again to follow up on her little cubs. And unfortunately, we haven't managed. We think she might have moved. But we have just got really, really exciting news that the guys have found the den site of a mother with tiny, tiny little lion cubs. Now, she's left the cubs, and obviously we're not going to hang out where she's keeping brand new cubs. But we are on a search for the lionesses themselves because then at least we can figure out exactly which lionesses they are. And it looks like we might have found them. Our signal might be a bit shaky here. I don't know. I've never, ever been down here in my life before. This is a, a new experience for me as well. But let's just have a look. Where is everybody looking? They've obviously spotted something. Come back. Manu's got it. Can't go back, Manu. The reverse is in the wrong. Woo! -woo. It's not banging into the other car. Hi, guys. Stop, 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 says Manu. Well spotted, Manu. Let's see what we've got here. I think we found our plan for. Oh, goodness gracious. Move forward a bit. Yes, I see that. Well done, Manu. Hold on, everyone. We're going to get a little... Okay. Uh, let's not crash into a car. There we go. Oh, that is about as good as it's going to get, I think, folks. So there's one of our lionesses. And potentially the mother of cubs that are just a few days old. Now, the nice thing about where she's chosen for her den is that it's in the middle of this lugger or river system, which means that, they, you know, no matter where we spot them from, we'll always be a very, very comfortable distance away from her. But I think what we'll do is we'll try and stick with them or at least return here as it gets dark, because there's a very, very good chance that she's going to go back to those cubs and give them another feed. The younger they are, the shorter the time, sort of the time distances between the mother's visits she's got to go back and suckle them regularly they're tiny they've got tiny tiny little tummies so they can't drink much milk barbara our cubs will be safe i mean they'll be completely safe well as completely safe as they can be when they've reached sexual maturity and i'm talking specifically of female cubs so barbara's wondering about what age the cubs will be safe from a male takeover there we go our lioness is up oh girl sabotage that's not the ideal place for you to be um, so barbara is talking about uh, pride takeovers and when the cubs will be safe the females at around about three years old which is when they will be experiencing their first easter cycles but actually potentially even earlier at around about two and a half years old young males will never ever be safe from a pride takeover once they reach sexual maturity of course then they become competition to incoming males and they will have to move out which is what happened with the young kuhuma male uh, many years many years ago but about two years ago when the birmingham boys took over he he didn't leave immediately but he did leave relatively soon after the birmingham boys established themselves <sighs> okay plan 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 for the afternoon i think we'll probably leave this area because these lionesses it's hot they're gonna hang out here and then we'll just cross fingers and go back to the den site as it starts to get dark and hopefully our lovely lioness decides to go back there as you can see there's a few people who are really wanting to see these lions we can't from our perspective so i think let me try once more to reposition i did want to try and get an idea of who they are but i don't think oh everybody's doing a everybody's doing a shuffle this is how bumper bashings happen <laughs> Oof. all right my lines are playing hard to get so we're going to have to do some concentrating and shuffling around. Fortunately for all of us, the lions of Juma are being slightly more cooperative. And welcome back to these very hot and bothered lions. Now, <clears throat> a little bit earlier in the show, we were talking about how elephants are able to keep their core body temperature down by having 
evolved these really big ears which allow which allow for the elephant to flap its ears and to, to put all its blood through its ears and to cool its blood down in an animal with a very large body size. Now that's the limiting factor uh, which limits very fast or very energetic movement in animals that are big is the fact that your, your body temperature and your, your muscles build up such a lot of metabolic heat it takes a long time to cool your body down and that really restricts large bodied mammals from moving around very quickly through the heat of the day. Elephant have evolved the ears, lion have not. Lion are at that pinnacle of the, the biggest that you can get, roughly, um, and still remain fairly active for long periods of the day. Any bigger, and lion's activity periods would be cut even shorter, and in my opinion would have a drastic effect on their ability to feed themselves. Um, lions are skating that, that ragged edge between being just too big and getting too hot in some environments and not being able to hunt the whole day and being too small to really make use of the large boned herbivores and their size and their bulk which basically affords them a coat of armor. But this is the result of that, is the fact that for large portions of the day these animals must stay inactive. <laughs> we are live, live. Good. Here we are, close to the southern boundary of Kenya, which I think is probably only about 300 meters that away. And what we have is some remnants of the 2017 wildebeest and zebra migration. There they are, all together. See them? And they're right close to the Tanzanian border. Now many of you would have seen during the course of the migration season, as uh, much as we tried to avoid it, you'd have seen herds of cattle come wandering past from time to time. And they certainly have had a very good migration season, the cattle. They come in from time to time and then go away. I don't think they'd do a huge amount of harm at this stage. But the shortness of the grass here, I don't think is necessarily only due to the wildebeest and the zebra. Of course, the Maasai have been herding cattle in this area for thousands, well, not thousands, but probably 8,000 years or so. And so, it's not surprising that the ecosystem thrives even with cattle in the area. And there are some black rocks that are different from the black rocks on which the lions live. But we're going to go back towards the Black Rock Pride. Yeah, I think we'll probably wind our way slowly back there now as it starts to cool. And hopefully sort of round about sundown we'll be with them again. But it's still very hot out here. I mean, this is the hottest afternoon I've experienced here since last year. And like I say, I probably sat at about 85 degrees or so. Bribri, I think they do. There are some that will say not and some that will actually give you a definite uh, answer to this and I, I'm not sure that you can, you, unless you collar every single one. You say, oh, some of the, do some of the migrants become residents and stay here and then perhaps migrate the next year? I'm sure that they do, especially the zebra. I'm pretty sure that they would do that. The wildebeest, yeah, I, I reckon some of them stay. This, why wouldn't they? You know, It's not like it gets freezing cold here and they've got to leave. There is plenty of food, especially after a good rainy year like this, and I wonder if that so-called loiter herd won't become much bigger after a year of rain like we've had here this year. So I'm going to say yes, some do. Now, why don't we just drift slowly down the road here. It's such a beautiful scene, this. I've never been this far south and this far to the east, and I have to say, I mean, it's always nice to explore a new area, but this is just really special. And I love a good hill, you see, and there are lots of lovely hills around here. James, you're wondering if along with the topi it's birthing season for any other animals here in the Mara? Well, the impala seem to be giving birth, so yes, I'd say for the impala. Certainly one or two Thompson's gazelle are giving birth, so absolutely I'd say perhaps for them too. And there is one of my favourites, the coax hartebeest, just having a little bit of a jog through the mixed herd. You see him there, Ferg? 
There he goes. <laughs> they are such funny, ungainly looking creatures. Hiding behind a rock and a tree that is... Uh, no idea what it is, I'm afraid. Oh, he's great. Dylan, you want to know if there are any koalas here in Africa? That's a really interesting question that has actually quite a long answer. The answer, well, the short answer is no, there are no koalas here. You want to know what animals live in trees here? I guess the primates, the monkeys, uh, the hyraxes, there is a species of hyrax that Steph was showing you earlier. They're called the tree hyrax, unsurprisingly, that lives in trees. Squirrels we get that live in trees here. Bats, of course, and of monkeys, but we don't get koalas. Koalas are, of course, marsupials. And marsupials are only found in the New World, and I think there's one species, if I'm not mistaken, found, not in the New World, in Australia, in Australasia. And I think there's one species that's found in uh, South America, but there are no African marsupials. And a marsupial, of course, is a mammal that gives birth to a very, very underdeveloped fetus that then climbs into the pouch where the nipples are, and it feeds in the pouch and lives inside the pouch until it's big enough to kind of be independent. And a kangaroo is a classic example, of course, of a marsupial. All the mammals in Africa are placental mammals. In other words, they function exactly the same as a human being functions. With internal development of the youngster and then birth. It's a really interesting question, so no marsupials here. And of course the koala, one of the laziest animals in the world, next to, uh, well, rangers basically. Guides are, tend to be the laziest people in the world, but other than guides, uh, koala renowned for being lazy because, of course, its nutrient, uh, the nutrients it derives from the gum trees it eats, very, very poor indeed. And so it really doesn't have a huge amount to work with in terms of energy. That's why I was giving a bit of a giggle at the beginning because, you know, the koala is renowned for being so lazy, but I know people just as lazy as that. Let's carry on going, drifting down this magical little road. The sun has been blinding today from the time it popped up over the horizon. Fergus and I have been shielding our sensitive eyes what colour are your eyes, Fergus? They used to be blue, red. Yes, they used to be blue, they are now red. You see, our sensitive blue eyes. We're going down into these lovely rock fields. They really are just spectacular. Until, of course, you come across a lion lurking behind one and you happen to be on foot. Elise, just keep checking the comms with me as we go through this dip. I am copying you still, Elise. Yeah, no, you see I've lost them now. Alice, see next question we'll have to give again once I've got up over the top of this little hill. Give me one secondo. Whoops. It's a wattled, a wattled plover. I'm not going to stop for it. I just want to get up to the top of the hill here. Try again. Try now, Alice. Yeah, got you. No, lost you. Thor. One second. No, that's not going to work either. So we try those cokies. Try now, Ellis. Sorry, everybody, just trying to sort out the radio comms. We really are very far away from home. Got you now, Ellis. I can hear you. Look at this wonderful scene of Coke's heart to beast. Male and female, I 
can't tell the difference between the two. I'm assuming the one in front being the largest is probably the male. Oh yes, there are, there is. Uh, Steen says there's a different species of hartebeest in South Africa. Yes, there is. I think there are a number. Uh, let me just find them for you. The red hartebeest is probably the most common one in South Africa. This being the coax hartebeest. They've all got those very odd shaped horns and funny looking heads and slopey backs. And I'll just quickly find the answer for you here. Hartebeest, acephalus, bucephalus, interesting. That was, of course, Alexander the Great's horse, if I'm not mistaken. There are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different subspecies of the Hartebeest. And the one that we find in South Africa is uh, known as Nkonzi, A.B. Nkonzi. No, that can't be right. Lule. No, they've got the wrong colours here. Anyway, it's this one here. I tend to agree with you, Senak. You say they're the most beautiful antelope. I tend to agree with you. I think it's this one that we find all the way down in South Africa. Hat in the way. I do apologize. Gormless. Anyway, there they all are. Lots of them. Unfortunately, they only give the Latin names here. They don't give the the common ones, so I, I, it's difficult to say which one is exactly the one we get in South Africa, so I think it's the one at the top, but it might not be. I take it back. I'll have to do a little bit of reading of this, and then I'll let you know. Mm. Monique, you say they have very long faces. I have to agree with you, they do have very long faces. Oh, here we go. It's very simple. Um, Cape Kalahari, Kama. Is this one so this one is found in the Cape and the Kalahari so that would be the one that we'd probably find in South Africa and then oh, of course then there's the Liechtenstein's Hartebeest off ob obviously that was very stupid of me that's the Nkwanzi that's this one the Liechtenstein's is also found in South Africa so those two there all righty, we're going to move on from this great mystery of the Hartebeest, Acephalus, Bucephalus, and find out from Stefan Winterburg whether his lions are ever going to get up. I suspect not. Welcome back to these cute little cubs, and we've repositioned slightly, and they're starting to get a little bit more active, and the reason for that is there's a breeze that's starting to blow and it's keeping everyone nice and cool, blowing away this heat build-up here. And just look at that pretty little cover. Could anything be cuter than a lion cover? I suppose your own child might be. <coughs> now they'd already be eating meat. Um, they would be tolerated around carcasses at the moment in sort of a casual uh, acceptance of the fact that they're still babies and they can do what they want and they don't really take that much and they put up quite a fight they growl and they scream around carcasses and you know they'll get their mouth full or two uh, they won't be tolerated around males he'll give them a swift discipline and a swat about the head um, and uh, and they'll still be heavily reliant on mom's milk at the moment and for the next couple of months at least anyway they will be heavily reliant on mother's milk i always find that cubs once they weaned at about nine months um, they get very scraggly from nine months to about 14 months they end up being uh, these little uh, like big, you know like teenagers get all knees and feet and ears and no body and uh, after that period then they start to fill out a little bit and get their muscles and look much healthier. Now Francis, all the way from Israel, uh, would like to know, um, would lionesses leave their cubs uh, at a den site even if they're a couple of days old? Yes, she would. Um, <clears throat> lions prioritize their own survival, adult lions prioritize their own survival above all else. And milk is a very 
is a very expensive, from a met metabolic point of view, a very expensive substance to produce. And she will need to eat. Lions starve to death in about two weeks. They've got a very fast metabolism. And looking after a family of babies means that she's going to need to eat. And <clears throat> giving birth to altricial babies, meaning babies that are born blind and helpless like lions do, will require her to leave the cubs. They're not capable of following her for the first eight weeks. They're born blind, virtually helpless. So she'll give birth. She, within a couple of hours to a couple of days, will have recovered enough to stand up and go and join her sisters for a meal. And will then come back and feed the babies at intervals. I once watched a lioness feed her babies just for two hours a day. Um, obviously I didn't know what she was doing at night, but it didn't seem like she had gone back to the den site at night. She'd hunt with her sisters in the late afternoon, early evening, and then when you'd find them, they'd all be together in the morning on a carcass, and then she'd walk in the middle of the day to go and feed her babies, and then leave them in a, a rocky area. This lioness probably did very much the same and spent her days walking between cubs and carcass or cubs and sisters. Now those periods are shorter. She'll fetch her cubs to kills. And we see that quite often where the pride will make a kill, the lioness will eat, she will gain just enough to give her energy for the next day and then she'll up and go fetch her babies and then return with the babies to finish eating if there's anything left. This little one. They're chewing a stick just now. They're very cute. The reason why they chew stuff is their teeth buds are itchy. And they have milk teeth, they'll lose those milk teeth and get their adult teeth, same as our children. And they'll chew sticks to uh, to get rid of the itch. Now Sandy, you'd like to know how many lions there are here. What's the head count? It's a good question. I haven't actually counted them yet. So the three babies. Oh, excuse me, Sylvie. So Sylvie, you want to know how many lions are here. So let's count from the back. There are three babies. Then on the left hand side, another three. There are six. Then three again. That's nine, ten, eleven, plus a male. And then there's another youngster that we saw lying in the shade on the other side of the babies, so that's 12 plus a 13th one on the far back end of the uh, of the, the lion lying in the shade, so in other words in the drainage line behind them. So we've got, f that's including the male, we've got 14, 15 lions here at the moment. And as far as I know, there are 14 cubs and 5 adult lioness in this pride. All the lioness are here. So Nelly, you, you've asked where the injured lioness is. I can only imagine that she's lying... I don't actually know, that's a good question. I would imagine that she's this lioness that's lying... No, that's the cub. I don't know, she could be lying off the edge, um, behind these babies somewhere. I haven't seen her, which is a bit worrying, considering the distance that these lions have covered in the last 48 hours or so. Um, but nonetheless, lions will appear at carcasses and kills. I once watched the lion, she had broken her hip. And she spent the better part of three months alone. Uh, she starved until her bones knitted to a point where her, it looked like her skin had just been sprayed onto a, a skeleton. And then one of her daughters came and joined her. Right when we thought she was at her last legs. And the daughter used to kill stuff and then bring it back to feed her mom. And that lasted another month or so. And then what happened was this female all of a sudden arrived at a giraffe carcass that the pride had killed, limping um, on her one leg, which is obviously still incredibly painful. But she made it to the, the giraffe carcass. And after that, she just got better and better and better. She always carried a limp as long as I knew that lioness she had a limp after that but she kept up with the pride and she was fed and looked after and she she, uh, she you know I wouldn't say regained herself but she she joined the pride again as an active member of the pride if not for hunting socially uh, 
Well, let me send you over to Jamie, who has uh, found some mongoose for you. I had, I had found some mongoose for you, and I'm going to try and find them again if I could work out how to get there. I was really convinced this road was going to go to where I wanted it to. Hold on. It will. It will. It's just going to take us a while to get around. This is the perfect time of day to spend a bit of time with some banded mongoose because they are just about to go to bed, so they'll probably gather together at their whatever particular termite mound they choose to go down into for the night, and they'll stop and groom each other, and oh my goodness, this road is going in the wrong direction. Hold on. Hold on. I'm scared now if I stop, they're gonna, I'm going to miss them. In fact, I think we might have already missed them. They were being so sweet as well. They were all standing up and looking like little meerkats. And then we'll start heading back towards that lioness. I'm sure she's going to go to her cubs as night falls. Oh, hold on. It's actually hard to believe, because I haven't driven here since the last rains. It's hard to believe how dry it's got in just a week or so of no rain. Dusty, all of the roads that we were slipping and sliding along have completely dried up. These people at Little Governors are gonna think I'm mental. Speeding past for mongoose. Ah, Stormy, the difficult question to answer. Stormy's wondering about my favorite African animal. And I always find it very difficult to choose. Uh, my favorite animal is the rhino. I love rhino. They, they've always been my favorite animal since I was eight years old. Jumbo. Um, I really, really love spending time with elephants. I find that it's, it's always a magical experience, whether you're just sitting peacefully with them, watching them feed, or whether they're doing something, they're always interesting. I love spotted hyenas for the same reason. I find them fascinating. I find their dynamics fascinating. And wild dogs. I, I, I really, really miss them. I've missed seeing them so much in the Mara. Manu, what's your favorite animal? A hyena, there we go. There's a mongoose back there. Well, that's unfortunate. There's the mongoose. Oh no, <laughs> they've gone to the other side of the road. <laughs> I'm just having one of those weeks. Here they go. Now they're all running away from me. Okay, we've got some. We've got some. You were coming in this direction. What made you change your mind? Apart from the crazy woman racing around the corner. I know that Faith loves elephant. <laughs> she just whispered, I do, from the back. <laughs> Faith loves elephants. It's hard to choose, though, because I think we're also biased by the animal that we spend a bit of time with. Because I think, you know, if you, if, if you spent enough time following banded mongoose around, you develop a, a brand new appreciation for just how special they are. And that applies to most animals across the board. I've always found that I, especially as a, as a small child, I struggled to connect in the same way with something like a baboon or a monkey. And I, I think that was just because they terrorized me as a child, quite honestly. I think that that, that played a large role in my initial feelings about them. But rhino are what inspired me to do this, to take this on as a, as a lifestyle, not just a career. I was eight years old and I got to go to the rhino sanctuary and I loved every minute of it. is a car that wants to come past us. I'm just going to pull off the road ever so slightly. One day I'll learn to do that. Every time I stop, one day. Not yet, but one day. I think we found the termite mound that the mongoose are going to bed in. 
Sinak, yes, mongoose will use burrows to escape from predators. Absolutely, they will. They will. They have a series of termite mouths within their territory that they have sort of bedtime tunnels in, but they also have escape tunnels. And they'll run, and th their first choice is to disappear down a hole if they're being chased by a predator. Their second choice is to disappear into a tree or a thick bush or something like that. And they can climb. I don't know if any of you saw the footage from Scott's uh, inc unbelievable. I've never seen anything like that scene with the cheetah chasing after the after the white-tailed mongoose. But that was that's a once-in-a-lifetime kind of sighting. Seen lions chase after the banded mongoose. We saw it the other day with the ridge pride on the other side of the river. The biggest threat will probably be smaller cats, though. I miss seeing dwarf mongooses often as well. We hardly ever see them here. They are around, but we just don't see them regularly. Our little banded mongoose taking advantage of the last few rays of the sun. They are strictly, strictly diurnal creatures, unlike the white-tailed mongoose. Right, well, speaking of the amazing situation where Scott had the cheetah chasing the mongoose. Scott himself is out this afternoon. Let's go and find out what other magical thing he has to show you. Good afternoon, everyone. And we do have some potential magic lined up for you here. You can see a wildebeest carcass in the foreground. And directly beyond that, you can see a cheetah's head between two bushes. It's not the only cheetah there. There are five cheetah in total. Now take a look at this. They are not the only animals in these plains. There's a very, very large herd of wildebeest making their way towards them. There hasn't been any game in this area, at least this morning, when we left the cheetah under those same bushes. But they've got lucky, and a lot of potential meals have come wandering straight towards them. Now it's going to be interesting to see what happens. Um, I can't be certain whether they are going to hunt. They are getting hungry. There's no doubt about that. Their last meal was yesterday morning. My name is Scott Dyson. It's great to have you on board. I'm teamed up with Craig and a whole bunch of flies this afternoon. It's a beautiful afternoon, as I'm sure you are well aware, having spent time with Jamie and James already. And I'm looking forward to spending the night out with the cheetah. If they don't get lucky this evening, our plan is to stay with them until they might decide to do some hunting in the morning. So we are loaded up with coffee and dinner, our mattresses, some blankets, and are really looking forward to spending the night out. It is going to be absolutely beautiful, and I'll show you exactly why it's going to be so beautiful. Craig, if you don't mind showing that big funny ball in the sky there. Ah, oh, look at that. The moon. It's almost full. We know that it's not full because as the sun sets, a full moon rises, hence illuminating the moon perfectly. But it's almost full, so we're going to have a very bright evening, which helps following these animals a lot easier. You can drive around without any headlights, so it is going to be absolutely magic to be out. And of course, if there's any action, we'll be sure to go live on Facebook, even though the safari may have come to a close. Okay, let's just take one last look at what these cheats are doing. Sorry, guys, and then putting Craig all over the show here. Um, like I say, I'm not sure what is going to happen here, but you can see the cheetah are certainly looking at these wildebeest. And I think it will be safe. Oof. I'm torn whether to send you off. There's so much awesome stuff happening on Safari this afternoon that I don't want to keep you on my vehicle and prevent you from going and seeing what other action is unfolding with the others. However, I would obviously feel like a bit of a monkey if I sent you away and the cheetahs started doing their business. So let's just give it a moment or two and see what happens as this herd continues to meander straight past them.
Hello, Dylan. It's wonderful to have you with us. Watch closely now. Because they're running, it could trigger the cheetah to chase. Obviously, it's difficult to see what the cheetah are doing because there's a wall of wildebeest between us and them. But no cheetah are up. They're definitely looking at these wildebeest and they may continue to follow them. We certainly are going to follow them. And let's do that while I continue to answer Dylan's question. Dylan, you would like to know if these animals are free roaming or if they are bound to a given area. And no, they are completely free roaming. There are no fences around this reserve or the Serengeti. So they can go wherever they desire between Kenya and Tanzania. And to be honest, a cheetah could walk straight from here, fairly unobstructed, all the way into the capital city, Nairobi. So those are the realities of this unfenced wilderness. And isn't it wonderful that the animals can do exactly as they please? Well, you may notice there are a few other vehicles enjoying the sighting with us. And it's wonderful. Imagine how excited their guests are with these prospects. Steffi, you'd like to know how far away these cheetah are from the wildebeest at the moment. And I'd say about 60 meters or 70 meters. Sometimes it can be a little bit confusing. The shots can be a little bit compressed because we park quite far away so that we don't get in the way. But yes, I'd say about 50 or 60 meters. Certainly not too far away for these cheetah to launch an attack. But I have been lucky enough to spend quite a lot of time with these boys and in the time that I have spent with them I've learned that if it is this stage of the evening although they may be excited by any prospects of dinner that pass by they tend to wait until the cover of darkness especially working a big herd like this when it's dark they can create more chaos and confusion and that way it's easier to single out an animal that they see fit to bring down during the day, the wildebeest have a better chance of fighting back. And we have, on one occasion, seen a wildebeest bowl over one of these cheetah directly off a young wildebeest that they had brought down. So, I am guessing that is what is going to happen tonight. They could just wait another 45 minutes or so until it just starts getting dark. And then, I'm guessing, they're going to run in like a pack of wolves, create some chaos and confusion. Oh, it looks like that one wildebeest may have seen... The cheetah, the one on the far right, they're looking directly into the bushes. Let's have a look what the cheetah are doing, Craig, quickly, sorry. Yeah, the cheetah's fairly, got its head fairly high up. So I'm guessing that wildebeest could well see it. It may just be not certain of what is there. Just feeling a little bit like there's some danger, but not sure what. And because things seem to be calm for now, I doubt anything will change in the next few minutes. I think if anything was going to happen, it would have been as the wildebeest moved past initially. So we'll be standing by and we'll be very, very quick on the radio to call you guys back as and when anything changes. But for now, you're going across to a scene of cuteness with James. We've come back to the cubs, obviously, you can see that. I don't think that all of them are here. The lionesses are fast asleep. I can only see three or four cubs. The rest are either in the thicket away to the left, or they're sitting in their little rock hidey hole. And if they're sitting in their little rock hidey hole, well, then we'll have a lovely time when one of these lionesses bothers to get up off, uh, well, I suppose there's zebra-engorged bellies. There we have them, but this little one is now having a good time, just having a bit of a play there. And so what we can do is have a watch at him learning to use his teeth on that bush. And his claws, I suppose, he's doing it in a fairly lethargic manner. It's a lethargic sort of a day, really. And Dylan, you've asked one of the most commonly asked questions there ever is about lions, and it's one of the ones that um, is very difficult to answer because I'm not sure that we know the answer. You say, how do the cubs know to stay behind when their mothers go hunting? And the answer, Dylan, is that, uh, well, she normally gives them a sort of rough growl sometimes, 
Often, though, it seems to be some kind of unspoken communication that happens, and she will just kind of walk off, and the cubs will go into their den and stay there. I think when they get a little bit older than this, when they are sort of three months and above, it probably becomes a lot more difficult for the mums to make them stay, and I think it's then that they sometimes have to have a little bit of an aggressive interaction. They'll give a bit of a growl or something like that. Excuse me, having a little bit of uh, wetting of my whistle with a cup of something hot and wet because we have been driving through the most dreadful dust and my throat is very dry as a result. Look at those vicious little needle-like claws. Oh, look at it. Oh, Laura Moore, you say you'd love it when they tuck curl their toes. I know exactly what you mean like that. It is very sweet. Look how blue the little eyes are. I wonder if this is a male or a female. Little female, I think. Little lioness. Ow. struggling to find anyone to play with her. I shall just have a little sip of something. I'll try to anyway. Here we go. Maybe a bit of action. I think we've got here at the right time. I'm also hoping that the male is going to emerge. I know where he is, or I know where he was. He was very flat and in very thick guarry thickets, and for me, there's very little less inspiring than watching a flat male line in a guarry thicket, and so I haven't gone back there. And I think quite possibly he'll come out as it gets darker. So we'll just wait and see what happens here. I'm very excited that the cheetah have been found again. That is very nice indeed. Let's hope they get up and do some hunting. They have given us a tremendous, tremendous show over the last three months or so. As have these lions over the last three days. I'm really grateful for Brent for suggesting that we come down here and see what was going on. Hello Violet, you're just age five. I think you've got a lovely name, Violet. Um, Violet, they are sleeping because why do you sleep? I know you probably sleep because your mother tells you you have to sleep and sometimes you don't really want to when she says go to sleep, Violet. Well, these lions love to sleep and they love to sleep because they get very tired and you know all cats and all dogs get even more tired than humans so I know that sometimes you think goodness gracious how can my mum and dad still be asleep in the morning when you wake up and they're still asleep well lions and dogs and cats and leopards and jaguars and all of those animals they love to sleep even more than adult human beings because they just get very tired and the reason they get even more tired than us is because they only eat meat and because they only eat meat well it means that they have struggled to make enough energy to move so they have to sleep a lot Well, you said your lions dream. Well, uh, yes, this one is dreaming of the, uh, hopefully, the king that she will one day marry when he comes walking over the black rock to claim this territory as his own. Uh, the one, oh, obviously talking rubbish. I know exactly what you mean. D dogs, of course, seem to dream and chase things in their sleep. I've definitely seen lions. I don't know if I've seen them chasing something in their sleep, but they do have that kind of... Uh, move around in a bit of a flap and a little bit of a growl every now and then in their sleeps. Not like dog not like domestic dogs do though. I'm sure they must dream a little bit. This one is totally alone and being awake, isn't she? Yeah, Lara, they do, you know, they, you say, do they, do they outgrow their eye color? Yes, uh, they do, their eyes do, oh, they have that bluish hue to them now, and when they're older, they don't have that. Sometimes they're orange, and sometimes they're sort of that 
greeny yellow lion color but they don't have the same color that they have there now that kind of deep navy blue almost black and you only see it's blue when the light catches at the right angle There's a magnificent sunset going. Fergus is very upset with me because I wouldn't stop and park in a place where he could show it. Anyway, we'll head over there, have a quick look at that, and I suspect that Jamie, to whom we are going to go now, has probably got that in a slightly better light. We've got a gorgeous sunset, but it's what is happening in the last few rays of the sunset that's attracted my attention. See this tiny baby Thompson's gazelle trotting along next to mum? Well, it's had quite the evening. Now it's running away from a hyena that's slowly but surely making its way towards it. The hyena, I don't think, has any intentions of hunting it, but the gazelles aren't going to take any chances. They're going to make sure to keep a distance between them and the hyena. But what really happened and what absolutely astounded me is not the hyena wandering through. That happens relatively regularly out here, I would say at least once or twice a day. It's the eagle that went for the baby Thompson's gazelle that really took my breath away. It happened very quickly and it stopped very quickly and from what I can tell it's a tawny eagle from its brief pass over. As you can see it's getting dark so it is quite difficult but judging by the, the size of it I would say that it's a tawny eagle and it went for the baby Thompson's gazelle. That's the only explanation. At first I thought it was going for something next to the baby Thompson's gazelle but it swooped over it a few times and the gazelle started to panic and sort of run around and, and mum clustered next to the little one. Now that would have been a first for me. I've heard of them going for, for small antelope but I've never ever seen it before. What is our hyena doing? Sorry, I'm looking now. Ah, I see what our hyena is doing. I'm sorry I drew attention to you. My sincere apologies, I'm looking into the sun and I didn't quite realise what you were up to. Oh well, it's over now. Where have our Tommies gone? They've dashed off largely. Our little baby one has safely made its way away from both hyena and from eagle. And we've got a beautiful sunset. Lynn, you're absolutely right. Male antelope do use their horns for fighting each other for mates. There is very strong correlation between antelope that have horns as females and antelope that live in open habitats like this one. And there's two reasons for that. One is obviously the, the horns act as a defense for the females that live like the little Tommies do out in the open plains, whereas they act as a hindrance for something like an Anyala or a bushbuck or a kudu that lives in dense vegetation and would want to hide rather than to fight. There is also another reason, and that is essentially the idea that the longer the, especially in antelope that live out in the open, the longer the males can stay with the breeding herd or with the mother, the better. So by the females having horns, it acts as a way of disguising the young males from the mature dominant males because essentially everybody looks the same. Whereas with females that don't have horns, the young males obviously stick out far more clearly because they will start to grow horns. So essentially the idea is that by the females having horns, they disguise the young males for slightly longer and that allows them to stay within the protection, if not, of, if not the herd, then at least next to their mums for a little bit longer without being chased away by the dominant males. So there's a very, very strong, if you look at it, Elant, same family as the Nyala, Bushbuck, Kudu, but live out far more out in the open plains. The females have horns, even though they're in the same family, the same tribe of antelope. Tommies have horns. Females, I mean, obviously. Wildebeest, females have horns. Buffalo, I know they're not antelope, females have horns. Oryx, females have horns. Sinak, the Tommy babies, it's amazing how, how quickly things change out here. The Tommy babies will be eating grass at about two or so months old. They'll be fully weaned by six months. And that is the point at which they could be separate from their mothers if they had to be. But they'll stay with their mums for another, or at least a year. 
between breeding seasons. Not quite a year. It'll be less than a year. But it'll be about between eight to ten months. They'll be in close to their mums. And then, of course, their mums come into estrus. They mate again. But the, the little ones could stay within the breeding herd for much, much longer and therefore close to their mothers. But they can survive from around about between four and six months old. Unlike something like a lion cub that needs far more care from mum and actually suckles for a much longer period. And speaking, of course, of lion cubs, let's go and see some of our favorite ones. These little guys are just woken up from their cat nap and are having a whale of a time wrestling with each other. Just look at that. Flat on their back. One cleaning. Hello everyone! You wouldn't believe it, but these cheetah just took off out of nowhere. You can see all the dust from the wildebeest that left them in a cloud of dust so thankfully you didn't miss anything it all happened so quickly and to be honest even we were not in the right position look at all this dust Whew. well that was exciting before you go I'd like to show you a beautiful view of the sunset because it is one of the best I have ever seen take a look at that now what may happen is these cheetahs may continue to hunt this herd as it gets dark but for now it appears like they are all regrouping and absolutely magical magical stuff indeed Good. let's get into position where we can have a view of them On Facebook. Sadly, you've joined at an inopportune moment. Oh, oh, sorry, you have been live for a while. I'm not too sure what's going on, but that's fairly standard issue. <laughs> um, so, yeah, like I say, I don't think these cheats are going to pursue this herd of wildebeest that they just. I think it was just kind of a, a chase that was triggered by the fact that the wildebeest all of a sudden just started running off and the cheetah got up and started chasing them. So it wasn't that the cheetah started the chase, it was more that the wildebeest started running away. And then the cheetah thought it would be a good idea to have a chase. Hello to Polo, you'd like to know if that was a wildebeest stampede, and yes, I guess it was. They were stampeding off away from these cheetah and they did a good job. At one stage I actually thought the cheetah were going to get one. But alas, they missed. It's still early on in the evening and they could continue to pursue this very same herd. That's only a couple of hundred meters off in the distance now. They've calmed down to a walking speed. And I guess those wildebeests know that rather than continuing to run blindly and waste energy and possibly run into other predators, just get away from the ones that you know are causing the trouble and then keep an eye on them. Okay, well soon it will begin to just be us in the sighting. All the other vehicles will have to head back to their camps. But we have the huge, huge privilege of being able to stay out after dark. And that is exactly what we are going to do. Let's do a quick little view of the sunset because it is so beautiful. And then we'll say goodbye to everyone. It's just about to drop below the horizon. Marvelous stuff from the Masai Mara. For all of those, for those of you who joined us on Facebook, we're going to say goodbye for now. Be sure to keep an eye on the notifications. We'll call you back as soon as these cheetahs get active and hunting again. Goodbye. Here we have a 
well, quite magnificent sea of a fig tree with the sun that's just set in between its sort of um, embrace, shall we say, and behind a few crotons and on a big black rock. We left the lions, we go back to them now. We just thought we'd come up here, well, to be honest, Scott thought, uh, not Scott, what's your name again? Fergus thought we'd come up here. He said this would be a, a really good shot. And I said, oh, Fergus, let's stay with the lions. I'm so tired of your sunset desires. And well, up we came and it was absolutely spectacular. I'm very glad we did. Isn't that gorgeous? I think it's immensely gorgeous. There have been some spectacular sunsets here and sunrises in the Maasai Mara, where we find ourselves now. And I think the moon is probably one day off being full, and we'll show that to you as well, because we're so very nice. Won't we, folks? Yes. There it is. There's a pole, Fergus, till I move. Isn't that not magnificent? Now watch Fergus's trick here. Fergus, do your trick for us. It takes too much time, okay. Look at all the marvellous things that you can see on the moon there. And that shaking, I'm afraid, is the wind. It's just very br uh, breezy. Just stunning. <laughs> wow. I mean, I don't know what to say about that other than wow. So, I, I mean, that looks pretty, f pretty full to me. I wonder if it's not full. What's the time? I'm told the mo full moon rises at six o'clock. Yeah, apparently tomorrow. Says Monique. Thank you, Monique. You say tomorrow. That makes sense. Great, marvellous stuff. Right, well, as the wind starts to blow, we're going to make our way back down towards the lions, I think. I've only seen four of the cubs, so I don't know where the rest are. And the big story, I think, for us to try and complete today is... Well, not so much the reunions, like we've been watching over the next last little while, but perhaps the male coming towards this bunch and to see how he interacts with them, the females and the cubs. Alrighty, let's head back to Stefan Winterbur and his cubs and find out what they are doing. We can't go right away. We have to just wait another five seconds and then we will be whoops to daisies with Steph. So firstly, I must... Uh apologize for getting the numbers of these lions wrong. There are actually 12 lions here, 12 lioness and cubs. Uh, with the male there's 13 and there might be a 14th one uh, lying on the other side of the bank. So the injured lioness I can't see. She is either right at the top of your screen below those two light dots. Uh, there's a fallen down stump. There's a lion lying there or lying just on the other side of the bank in the shade on the sand. Um, <clears throat> just judging from what I saw the other day, uh, her walking around, I don't think that she's not here. I think we're just not seeing her. So I think my um, my impression is that she's here until proven otherwise, I think, is the is the uh, the status quo that I'd like to maintain. These young cubs have, uh, have, are, are waking up now and then pesting the adults. They want to get going or they want to do something, like bored kids. They've had enough playing with each other. They were wrestling each other a little, a little while ago. Very observant. There's a vulture flying around here, and they, even at this young age, they're very observant of vultures. Now, the presence of these vultures, these, these vultures have come down to drink. Now, I don't know if it's because there's a carcass here somewhere. Have a look on top of the tree there and see. You can see that's a hooded vulture. Ah, I've parked Senzo in the middle of a stick, but you can just see, there we go. There's a hooded vulture. And that's what this young lion is looking at. Now, it's not uncommon for vultures to come and react to lions which are lying sleeping, especially when it's close to a drainage line, in case there's a morsel hidden here close by. It's difficult to see. I mean, it's a perfect drainage line for an ambush on a kudu or buffalo or zebra or something. 
We might well find that there's some remnants of the kill here from last night. This hooded vulture probably going to be staying there for the rest of the evening. Now I hear that there's a beautiful full moon, or two days from full moon that is arrive, arising in the morrow that you're having a look at with Jamie. That's still about half an hour away or so for us to see. It will start to rise a little bit after the sun has set, probably. Actually, it should be coming yeah, a little bit after. The, no, no, it's up already through the trees behind us. You can just see it. When it gets a little bit dark, I'll show you. Um, the moon here rises about is it 40, minutes, 40 minutes or so later every day. Proud Cat Mama, you want to know um, what colors lions see in? It's actually the source of a lot of debate um, as to what lions can and can't see in terms of color. I definitely think that they can to a degree see some form of color. Um, you've got two light receptors in the eye, you've got rods and cones, and in almost every animal there is rods and there's cones. In lions they're just more rods which are the light accepting organelle, not the light differentiating organelle. And so I think that they see in a high definition, very similar to sort of infrared light, if, if, if I were to draw my conclusion as to how lions see, it would be like infrared, and, and, and when we put on our infrared lights, it would be like that. Um, as to whether they see color, I definitely think that they'd be able to see color to a degree. I mean, and the reason why I say that is lions react almost instantaneously to a Maasai's red sugar. And if they didn't see color, they wouldn't be able to... What's the difference between a red sugar and a black sugar? Or a red sugar and a, and a green sugar? So, I definitely think that they do see some color. I don't think they see the vibrancy or the color range that we see. Um, but I, I, I do feel that they do see some. That's a nice question. The reason why they don't need to see color is that they eat meat predominantly and they don't need to see color to judge the fresh, freshness of meat. We need color to judge the freshness of, uh, of all of our vegetables and fruit that we eat. All right, on that we're going to wait for the sun to set a little bit more and for these lions to get a little bit more active. In the meantime, why don't you go off to Scott's Cheetah? Well, isn't this a beautiful scene with the slightly pink hue out to the west and these four cheetah looking out in that direction, wondering about what to do next. Now, there was another herd of wildebeest in that direction that was kind of slowly making their way towards them. So, I think it is going to make sense for us to reposition. We just came across here to try and get some low angles with that beautiful sunset in the background but like I said I think it'll be best for us to get onto the other side of this little ridge that they're peeking over to see what exactly is happening with that herd of wildebeest that is approaching so while we do that we will be sending you back to Mr. Hendry to Lou back to me yes and the lions which are chewing on a stick, some of them. Same one, I think. But the rest of them up now. Now, I can't see. Let's. We're going to try and count them. One, two, three, four, five. I think we're still missing four of them. The lioness is showing very little enthusiasm for their existence on planet Earth right now. But it is getting darker. The sun has now set. And so... We have another, say, 45 minutes or so of the drive left. And by the end of it, of course, we'll be in pitch black. And I think there may be some activity which could be worthwhile watching. Well, not that this isn't worthwhile watching, of course. I'm just slightly disconcerted by the lack of other people here. It was very nice, but it makes me wonder what they're looking at.
There's an interesting question from David saying, if two prides fought with each other, would males step in to stop the fight? Uh, you know, I would suspect that a number of people would say, uh, don't be ridiculous. But I've actually seen it happening, where two lionesses from one pride attacked one lioness who was on her own. And, look, I don't think he got in the middle to try and sort of say, come on, ladies, don't fight over me, I'm not worth it, or anything like that. But he certainly did seem to become quite distressed by the fight. Sometimes, however, that sort of aggression can spill over and result in the male attacking one of the females or attacking one of the prides. And so, while it, I suppose it might look like sometimes they do a little bit of uh, splitting up of the fights, I, it's not something that they do as a matter of course, no. We have seen two males fighting. Brent had an utterly astounding sighting at in, at Juma. During one of our rehearsals, two males had a full go at each other. And the females got involved, but they seemed to attack both males. And I think it was, <coughs> excuse me, just the kind of aggression of the situation that made them attack each other. And attack, you know, the females attack the males. And perhaps they were trying to say, listen, get away, you're going to harm our cubs. I'm not sure. All right, we've got a lioness who's up. And one of them made a little call. Oh. <laughs> That's very cute. One, two, three, four, five. With the stalking going on to <laughs> Palin, you're wondering about why some cup cat babies are called cubs and some are called kittens. It's English convention largely, um, but basically the the uh, babies that belong to the ge <laughs> to the genus Felis, so the small cats, the caracals and the wild cats and the servals, they all have kittens and then the bigger cats that belong to the genus Panthera, tigers and leopards and lions and the other big cats like the snow leopard, they will be called cubs. But it's an English convention, it's, there's no, you know, no real biological basis to it I suppose. Same as the way, um, you know, some herbivores are ewes and rams and others are calves and at least cows and bulls. It's just got to do with their size. It's very much a convention of English rather than anything else. Where is this lion going? Very uncomfortable. Oh, how wonderful. Burgers, do we have to watch this? We have cubs to look at. We have to see what the lion is doing there. Mm. Thankfully, the wind is blowing the other way. No, Monique, it really doesn't. You say it just doesn't get cuter than this. It most certainly does not. This, to me, is the cutest thing in the world. Yes, leopard cubs are amazingly cute. Wild dog puppies, likewise. But uh, I think both Brent and I agree that these things uh, just somehow take the cake. I mean, look at that. It is just unspeakable. She's calling the one lioness. And it's quite still now. And I just want to focus, keep an eye behind us and see if maybe the others don't emerge from somewhere. I mean, all nine were here this morning. I can't believe that they've lost some. Five there. There's the wattled plover shouting at them. Yeah, there are four of them a wall, which is very interesting. So we'll see what happens. I can't believe that harm's come to them. 
Did we see all nine in this corner? We didn't, did we, Fergus? We didn't see them all in this corner. I think four of them have gone down back into the rocks. Anyway, I really don't think any harms have come to them. There's still some calling. They might be around the corner there. Melissa, another co common question around these cubs is, can the mothers tell them apart, A and B, do they know which ones are theirs? And the answer is, I don't know. I suspect not. <clears throat> I think that the pride is designed so that there's no favoritism show. They all do this cross-suckling thing. And so, look, I don't suppose there's any biological reason they shouldn't know. Uh, you know, in a wildebeest herd of thousands or hundreds of thousands, the, c the cows know their own calves, so there's no reason they shouldn't know their own ones. But uh, I'm not sure whether they do or not. I'm not. I'm pretty sure somebody must have done an experiment on it to try and find out. The pr trouble with an experiment like that is that unless you are very clever and have a huge amount of time to set it up in the wild, you've got to do it in captivity, which of course then brings with it all sorts of ethical troubles. Now, we're going to have to put on our infrared lights, Alice. And so, in the next not too distant future, I think we need to head across to another feed just while Fergus puts them on. Otherwise, we're going to be caught with the darkness. So, let's head across to Steph, whose lions are doing what these lions are doing. Unfortunately, they have not got up yet because it's still a little bit brighter at Juma now. And here we've got the sun going down and a beautiful afternoon with these cats. They're just in their last moments of death-like sleep, to be honest. But soon, soon, they are going to be disappearing and the male will start to wake up. He is, ah, he is awake, he's busy cleaning himself. What are you doing? He's got a thorn in his foot or something. Even with that sparsely grass, that sparse grass cover that he's got there, you can see how closely his skin colour matches the grass around him. Imagine that in the dark. It'd be near invisible. Sun is going down now. Got a couple of seconds left of this big red ball in the sky. I didn't do it, you're asking, are the lions sleeping more because they're not eating as much? That's a nice question to ask uh, there. No, I've, I've, this is their usual activity period and they, uh, they really just, this is what they do. Um, they'll start to get more and more active uh, as it goes along. Um, I've actually found that uh, that lions become even more active the hungrier they are. They'll start to walk earlier in the evening, they'll walk for longer. Basically it's just like I suppose anything. The more you're out there and the more lions you have in the water so to say, the better your chances of catching something. That said though, this time of the year lions are almost always hanging around or associated to large water bodies. And that's what we've got here. We've got Bumblesook Dam right here. And I think these lions are going to do laps around the dam, hunting anything that sort of approaches the dam to come and drink. With the exception of that stick, that's a beautiful photograph. Now, I did have a look. I can confirm that there are two female cubs. And I don't know the sex of the third one. looks like a young male so I'm gonna say right now that I think there's two females and a male cub have a look. Well, it might all be all three females tough to say I haven't been able to see all of them and have a look at those spots very similar to a leopard's rosettes on the back of this cub you can see those rosettes they lose that very quickly they retain their spots though 
um, until they're probably about two and a half years old. If you come and have a look at this one that's close to us here, you'll see that the spots are on the on the legs just here. And that they'll keep until they're about two and a half years old. Look at that furry belly that they also get. Oh, big stretch. Uh, uh, arms curling in, stretching out all those tendons. Mother now doing the same thing behind them. They're all starting to wake up. Yeah. Well, not all. Some of them still look like they've been drugged. Drea, you'd like to know if the big male has interacted with the three new babies at all. He absolutely has, Drea. Um, the fact that we haven't seen it yet is, is rare. Uh, he's been hanging around with them for quite some time. And I think that, that they definitely will interact with him. He's not usually tolerant of them. Uh, he's going to show, you know, he'll growl and he'll put up with, uh, with a little bit of wrestling and a little bit of boisterous play. We're going to quickly go over to Jamie, who's got a line roaring. I don't have a line roaring. I've got a lion calling her brand new cubs. So we've come back to the den site, and if we're really, really lucky, everyone, if we cross every finger and hold every thumb and, you know, all of those things you do for good luck, we're going to see brand, brand new little cubs. She's calling, and they're calling back, of course, as I called you across. She's stopped. Now, don't go there, girl. Don't go there. I can hear the little things yowling down in the drainage line. Come on, girl. All right, everybody, let's just sit tight. Can you hear them? I think the wind is drowning out their calls. Little ow sounds. Frantic little calls from tiny, tiny little cubs. I know the wind is blowing. Oh, no, let's check to the right again, just in case. You can hear them. You can hear them. They sound like little cats. Yeah, she's calling them again. Oh, I'm so excited. My heart's pounding. Where are they going to go? There's a cup. Look, 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 look. She's picking it up. Look at that. It's a little sausage. Oh, you gorgeous little creature. I know it's dark, guys. You got the infrared lights on there, man. They don't look like they're on. Or oh, they know they are on. Look at this tiny, tiny, weeny creature. Oh, that is just a few days old, everyone. This, unfortunately, is as close as we can get. These cubs are very tiny. I mean, these are really but a few days old. Listen.
tiny cubs. A couple of days, maybe, maybe, no, let's say 10 days, I would say. From what I can see, it's difficult to tell. Oh, hold on, everyone. Our proud cat mama, lovely to hear you. I'm glad you were watching that. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Sorry, let me just concentrate on getting... I don't want to use our spotlight on cubs that small that I think most of you can understand, most of you know that we're very, very careful with our spotlight use with tiny cubs. Which means I just have to concentrate a little bit in the dark. I don't think we can... Is that her over there, Manu? I can just see a pale something. Um, that's her there. There we go. In the left third of your screen, there, in the center of your screen. Up a little. No, no, left of your screen. Left, left. There we go. That's her there. Okay, I'm going to reposition one more time. Now that I know exactly where she is, I'm just going to turn around so we've got a better angle. Proud cat mama. Uh, yes, the, the little lion cubs are born very, very altricial, without little teeth. Oh, somebody's been driving there. Not the only one. So we are also in the non-off-roading area, which um, does change things as well. But with this with cubs this small, we wouldn't be going close regardless. So proud cat mama, yes, tiny little lion cubs are born completely altricial. They are essentially helpless. Blind, unlike hyena cubs that are born with their eyes open, cubs that are born with their eyes open and with fully erupted teeth, lion cubs are born tiny little blind bumbles of helplessness. Is that the cub there or did she just abandon the thing? Is that a cub? I think that's her foot. I think that baby's still shouting at her. Hey, mummy. Did you just leave it? Yes, you did just leave it. It's squealing at you. It must be just below her, somewhere there. Just below her in that dip down that way. Manu, can we look down? Okay. <laughs> I think, let me just stay for one second. Let's just have a look just below her. Sorry, Manu, let's just check down, down below her. Where's this cub? I can hear it. And I don't know how many there are. She's calling them. You've got a really good idea as to just how far back we are, the fact that we're across the lugger from them. What I'm going to do is shift onto that road over there. Oh. Oh, you're making such a noise. You're going to draw attention to yourself. I'm just going to reposition ever so slightly because I misgaged where the road is. Okay. Well, I go get what I'm going to consider to be the cutest cub in the universe, obviously. Let's go back across to James, who's also having baby lions galore. Well, there's the lioness, and she's, she's the one who moved away from the others. And the distressed yelling you can hear in the background is a... Um... Um... Um, a wattled plover, that's right. And clearly the lioness is quite near to her nest. Now three cubs came up here, she kept calling. Then it looked like one of the adults was going to come up. I'm still not sure how many cubs we have here. I thought maybe we had only had five, but now I think I've counted six. There are two. They still are so small, they can't do their little growl, 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 growling. So they just have to make little squeaking noises. Oh, shut up, bird. So there are the others. Ooh, 
<laughs> Is the bird shouting at the cub? Oh, interesting question, Pollen. You say, would a, an owl try to take a cub? Yes, I suppose a giant eagle owl or a spotted eagle owl could easily try and take a cub of this size. I think that would certainly be possible. I haven't seen many owls big enough. I've seen barn owls here, I've seen grass owls. But I haven't seen anything the size of a... Have we? Have we seen giant eagle owls here? Yes, I think we have. But, you know, there are no big trees around here, so I think they're unlikely to be around, but yeah. In theory, I'm really struggling to think straight there. The lioness has got the Helen with the, with the bird. <laughs> she surely can't stay around here for long with that noise. It feels to me like I'm having a dentist drill through my skull with that noise. It is she, extremely noisy, but... All right, straight across to Jamie. She's found what she was looking for. Look. Listen. Hello, 
To those of you that have just joined us and welcome to the most incredible scene I think I've ever witnessed in all my time following lions in the few months that I've been here in the Masai Mara. And we are coming to you live in this amazing little tiny raincoat screeching for mum, desperate to get her attention. And you are watching this live in the Masai Mara as this little tiny fragile creature wobbles its way out of its den site and leaves us with questioning. Oh, just listen, just listen to this. Oh, you're making such a noise. Wobbles its way out of the drainage line and leaves us all wondering what on earth mom is thinking. Now, this little cub is only, I would say, now looking at it, maybe about two weeks old, that Judy, you say such tiny little roars. I know. They are utterly adorable. Mum is roaring somewhere just off in the bushes up at the top there. There is another lion coming up behind me. In fact, I think it's going to slink right past us at some point. Um, she's been roaring as well. And this little one's been joining contact calling desperately to Mum. But what is confusing me tremendously, I know it's him for now, but we're just going to wait patiently. What's confusing me is why Mum came down, called it out, and then promptly didn't stay to stick around long enough to feed it. Make it absolutely go back to the den, little one. Don't sit there yelling. It's the night time here in the mass of We're sitting in pitch black with just the moon and our infrared lights to guide us. So we're not in any way shining any lights on this little cup, and we are very far away from it. But yowling easily draw the wrong sort of attention. Yes, mum could come back, but at the same time, hyena, anything like that will be attracted to that sound. But why isn't mum coming back? I'm just waiting to see. Or not. Mum is going to come back to it. Oh, look, it is. you can see just how, just how very, very tiny it is. Laurie, you want to know how, when the eyes open, it's around about at the earliest three days after they're born, and I think it can take up to ten days after their birth. They're also born with their tiny little ears flat to their skulls, which is why I think this cub is around about two weeks. Its ears have started to pop up. And it's got such a big voice for such a little thing. Come on, man. Got a hungry little one there. No, that's a bush. You can't walk through there. Even as tiny as you are. Oh, I can hear her calling. I can hear her now. Come on, Mom. She's coming for it. No, she's not. Ferocious horse, little one. Did yourself proud. This thing to mum's calling as well. Oh, it might just be that, that look, this little cub is misbehaving. It might be that mum popped past to check on her cubs. The others might be sleeping. Like on average, lionesses will have between two to three cubs. So it's unlikely that this one's on its own. I know. Of course, Mum has to practice 
this tough love in the wilderness is harsh, and I feel sorry for this little one as well. It's young and desperate, and mom still hasn't come back to it. But you're right, tough love is a thing, and mom has got to, has got to feed herself. Is that mom? Hey! Mom! Here she is, well spotted on Manu's behalf. Mom? You have got a yowling little cub down there. I think it would really like a meal. <laughs> I think she's just having a break, folks. I really do. If she's this close to the cub, I thought she'd moved off, but if she's this close to the cub, we actually have nothing to worry about. That mother will not let anything get anywhere near the tiny bundle of fluff that's vanished. Where on earth have you gone? Right, it's just been the most phenomenal evening. Let's go back over to James, who is on the other side of the Mara River, and he's also got a tiny little blue ones. We have got some tiny little baby ones. I don't know how tiny Jamie's was, but possibly slightly tinier than these ones even. Nine of them there were yesterday. We're just counting them now. We're sitting with the Black Rock Pride, of course, three lionesses, nine cubs yesterday. And we've got one, two, three, four, five, I think, over here, climbing and suckling. None with that female. One very irate wattled plover yelling in the background there. And then with this female, we've got one... Two, three, so that makes eight, four. Oh, fantastic. We've been watching them, you know, and there were five, and then there were six, and then there were seven, and now, fantastic, they're all here. Nine little black rock cubs aged between five and eight weeks, I think. We are obviously in infrared. I'm sure Jamie explained that to you so that we don't have to shine any artificial light on these cubs whatsoever. Just the infrared, they don't see any light. They know we're here, of course, they can hear me speaking. But everyone very content here. Now, our main objective behind sitting with them for this length of time, we've been here now, well, on and off for the last three hours or so, the main objective was to see if the male that we found this morning would come and interact with the cubs, because that would be a really nice closing off of our little black rock cub story. be wonderful to see the male interacting with the cubs. That, for me, is one of the best things to watch, and I think many people agree with me, simply because, of course, it's such a wonderful human thing to have a father that takes care and takes uh, pays attention. And it's so rare in the mammal world, and so we love to see it as human beings. There is the wattled plover. They're obviously quite near his or her nest, and she is very deeply upset. She's been making that deeply unmelodious call. Right, let's head straight back across to Jamie and her tiny little cubs. I've got wonderful news. Mum is up and she's come to fetch the very, very indignant little lion cub. In fact, it's gone quiet now. I'm not even sure it hasn't fallen asleep somewhere behind this large tree. Now, these situations are very delicate, obviously, with a tiny lion cub involved. Be very, very cautious about the way that we move, the way that we behave around a den site. So let's sit tight. The last I saw of that little cub, it went around behind that large tree, and I'm pretty sure Mum was on her way to go and fetch it. When, as soon as she got eyes on where her cub was, she sat down and she was relaxed again. So definitely not an uncaring mother, definitely not a disinterested mother. Probably, like all mothers of tiny infants, just a tired one. She's probably had a long few days of nursing, and you can imagine those cries after a while perhaps start to break on the nerves just a little bit. She's still got to feed herself, she's still got to hunt. What an amazing job she's done. So special. Well done, Mom. You keep that little one safe, okay? I don't know how many you have. But I wish you all the best. biggest predator out here. It's not always that easy. Just imagine what it must feel like every time she leaves these cubs. Right, I'm going to be saying goodbye to those of you watching on Facebook. I'm so glad we could share with you one of my most magical Mara sightings to date. 
And if anything changes, we will be back with you as we follow the action in the morrow. What a voice. What a pair of lungs that creature has on it. To give you a sense of perspective, to try and sort of uh, uh, give you a sense of scale, that cub must be... Um, I think of how exactly to describe it. Now I'm staring at my hands. A completely blank look because I cannot think of anything that makes a good size. A comparison. Okay, it's like this big, that's how big it is. It's really tiny, I can't think of a comparison. I'm sure James would be far better of thinking of things to compare his lion cubs to. Um, no, I don't think I would be at all. Anyway, uh, there we have uh, the lion, one lioness, the one that was in the middle, now helping with the suckling duties. The lioness who is to the left of this has now disappeared off. And I think she's sick and tired of the wattle plover. And she's wandered off towards the left-hand side of your screen. And then we've got those little cubs there, just playing in the grass. And all of them very content, because of course mum's milk will now be, I suspect, quite a lot more voluminous, if you like, after the zebra meal they've had. I'm sure it's now being sort of, uh, what it, the word is not translated, converted to the milk that these cubs can use. And of course the cubs are much more active than the adults because the milk will be full of fat. And that fat, of course, gives them a huge amount more energy than the lionesses have because their prey has very little fat. Now I think this lioness is the youngest one. I think also that she is the best mother simply because she is the one that came to fetch the cubs yesterday and looked after them and suckled them yesterday evening on her own. And the way I can tell that is she, I think she's thinner than the others. I don't think she ate nearly as much of that zebra as that other fat lump you can see on the ground there. Perhaps we should call her Cinderella. You get it, Fergus. <laughs> there we go. This is a wonderful picture of one trying to <laughs> throttle her mother or aunt and the others trying to get a drink. Oh, look. You can always just hear the lionesses giving off these little growls. Because, of course, the little cubs have got teeth. And they're not shy to use them. You can see one uh, having a suckle, one chewing on its mother's big toe. <laughs> oh, it's just amazing. Imagine being harassed by that amount of lion flesh climbing on top now using it as <laughs> this is just too wonderful 
And now the other line, as you can see, is the... Oh, we have a return of the third one. The one in the middle, who I think is the best mum, we'll call her Cinderella, uh, not because she's the best mum, but because her sisters leave her to do all the work, uh, just in case you were wondering why I called her Cinderella. Um, I think that she is, you see how she's lying on her stomach there, basically it's impossible now for the cubs to have access to the teats, and she's done a huge amount of suckling today, now she's cleaning her sister, who definitely, as you can see, I think looks a lot stockier, thicker set. Much less slender than old cinders there in the middle. And definitely more tired after all the food she's been eating. I might be wrong, I mean they might all be the same age. Cinders just doesn't look quite as uh, quite as heavy as the others but in superb condition. I mean, the muscles on them are just phenomenal. And, you know, at the end of the... at the end of the, um... wildebeest migration season of the, of the Mara, you'd expect the lions to look like this. They've been eating well-conditioned wildebeest and zebra for the last three months or so, so you'd expect them to be in absolutely tip-top shape. And they certainly are. And this infrared light is really quite good at sort of, um, what do I say, bringing out the contrast of their muscles. You can hear the wind starting to build up again. No idea why it seems to come through in these squalls and then it stops again. Not a cloud in the sky. So we have a very beautiful starlit evening and also lit by the moon. Uh, it's... You could sit and watch this forever, couldn't you? If you were feeling sad about something, seeing this would make you feel much happier. <laughs> Talon, you say, which male has the glass slipper? Well, who knows? He's obviously given it to her already because she's had some cubs already. Yes, yes, I've got that. Thank you, Alice, very much for clearing that up. I had no idea what was going on there. Um, clearly, we... <laughs> <laughs> Clearly the glass slipper has already been placed on her foot because she has cubs and there are two males around here called the black rock males I think and one of them is around here I'm hoping that he'll come up here just now and see us but he's flat under a gory bush when I last saw him that's why I'm really sitting around here hoping for is just a little close off to our story of the male lion saying hi to his youngsters. Look at him. Tiny little foot pads. <laughs> Alice, who's directing, is on fine form this evening. We're going to go back across to Juma, and apparently uh, the person we are going to go across to is none other than the great slipper finder Superb waltzer, dancer, Prince Charming Stefan Winterborg himself. Left the lines. We needed to leave the lines because it became necessary for us to use the spotlight. And with uh, with those little cubs around, we don't want to put the spotlight on those little cubs, and so we left while it was still light enough to do so. I have got some uh, some good news for you though that the other two lioness the missing lioness were lying just off the edge of the bank there, and so all of the Inkahumas are together. They all look like they have had a little bit of food, not a lot, but they've had a little bit of food from the big male all the way through to the tiny cubs. Looks like they've, uh, they've, been, uh, they've been fed okay, and tonight they're lying next to Buffalook Dam, which is a very large body of, of water. There's every, every chance that they, are, uh, they get lucky tonight with something coming down to drink. It's full moon. Animal, well, near full moon, animals are walking around a lot during this time of the evening, making the most of the bright light and the opportunities to feed now at the end of the dry season. It's just all things good for the Nkuhumas. So hold thumbs that uh, tomorrow morning when we wake up, they're lying on something big and everyone's got a nice full belly and babies have got milk moustaches that they are too lazy to lick off. That's what I hope for them for tonight. They don't look too bad, all things considered. And so nothing to worry yourself about. What's that? Oh, sorry. I'm being told that I don't have my mic plugged in. I do have my mic. 
productive. Sorry, things are going wrong here with me at the end of the end of the uh, end of the show, and I think that's for myself and Senzo going to be the last time you see us for tonight. You'll see us again on Bushwalk tomorrow. You're off to Jamie in the Mara. Bye. We've had the most incredible evening. We really have. I've left the little lion cub for now, and I've left it for a very good reason. And that is because mom has gone. She's moved away a little bit. And what I don't want is for even just the sound of our movement and talking, even though we're far away, I don't want the little cub to stay awake because of that and put itself in harm's way. So we've left it. And since the darkness is falling and there's plenty of dangers out here, and we've got to find the male lion that was boring. He's got four minutes. In fact, probably even less than that, to roar one more time for us. It would be very nice if you did, boy. And what I might do is reposition quickly, quickly to get his head in. Let's see. Fast asleep. Hey, mister, you've been so vocal up until now. One more special roar for us, just because nothing beats the sound of a male lion roaring right next to the car. Okay, apart from a tiny baby lion cub roaring, I think that was the best. I will never forget those sounds. Screeching little thing. Come on, boy. That's one of the Kichwa males, by the way. Oh, I completely forgot to tell you which lionesses those are. I'm not sure, but I think as our male gets up, I think it might be one of the Olololos. Mm -hmm. One more. Come on. It's about to. It's about to roar. Hey, you can't play with our emotions like that. Male number two. Did I? Did, did my heart just jump out of my chest? Yes, Faithy. Faithy, you still there? <laughs> Sorry, that light just walked past, right past us. I could hear it coming, but I couldn't warn us because I couldn't warn poor Faith. Because I couldn't get the words out. <laughs> that was so cool. Right next to us. I love it when they sneak out of the dark like that. <laughs> I'm going to fan myself and recover from the shock and say goodbye to you all and send you over to James, who's probably got better control of his senses. Well, I hope... Perhaps I have better control of my senses, but I have been countlessly su or surprised countless times by lions, much like Jamie has now. And of course, when you have been so overwhelmed by the astonishing sight of a newborn cub, well, who can blame her? Our nine cubs, now a carpet, a writhing mass of fur, teeth, and needle-like claws on their ever-patient mothers and aunties. Look at them. They're having the best time. They're all warm because their mothers and aunts are full of food. They're contented. Nobody's angry. There's not a cross growl, a cross roar, nothing. Just happiness, cuteness, food, milk and warmth. Looks like a perfect place to be lying. If I wasn't convinced I'd have me head bitten off, I'd go and join them. Marvellous stuff. So we're going to sit here basically for the rest of the night. No, we're not. We're going to sit here probably for another hour or so, see what happens. And if the mails come, then we will go live again to Facebook. Until then, it remains for me to thank you very much for joining us all on our drive. A big thank you to Steph all the way in South Africa. Uh, Scott, of course, in the northern parts of the Masai Mara. Jamie in the far west, and I've been here in the far east. Most importantly, you who have been with us, thank you very much. East African time. Until then, bye-bye.